Good morning. Good morning. We'll call this meeting to order. Um, thank you so much. Clerk, do we have public comment today? Yes, ma'am. Oh, and you say the thing is highlighted? Yes. Okay. <coughs> All right, public comment. <coughs> the Board of Commissioners welcome our citizens' uh, comment. It is my goal to make this meeting run smoothly and efficiently in order for the government to be effective. In this vein, I ask everyone to follow the rules of the body as directed by the chair. I also ask that everyone please assist me in keeping order in this room during this uh, deliberative uh, process so that our citizens' time, including those watching on TV, uh, is not fruitless. With that being said, I would like to call our first citizen up, Mr. Larry Pierce. Would you please come forward, state your name, and I believe your subject matter is state representative Ray Barnes, or that can't be that. I write C <coughs> called Kitchen Chicken Scratch. Okay. Well, we'll just allow you to tell us what it is. All right, Mr. Pierce. Larry Pierce, Pierce. 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Good morning, Madam Chair, and everyone here, and especially the citizens. Mr. Pierce, before you start, I just want to make it clear to the citizens, and also to you before you start, you have a three-minute segment. I forgot to mention that piece. You have three minutes. <coughs> when you hear the buzzer, after your three minutes, please uh, wrap up. And I'm just saying I forgot to mention that, so please proceed. City Council has five. Y'all need to get I together. Know. I'm going to work on that. <laughs> and, and you just can't believe what I go through in one week to bring up to y'all in three minutes. Yes. Well, first off, I just want to show y'all that I went out to Sweetwater Park and I talked to the man, Mr. Make sure, Roger Bruce. I know so many Rogers. I talked to him and I couldn't find him. And, uh, I assure you, when I drove up there, I felt like the Lone Ranger. But I walked around, and my leg was hurting. And I went over to this lady over here, and I said, could you tell me where Mr. Bruce is and what he kind of is wearing? She said, yeah, let me call him. I'm his wife. <laughs> I, said, I said, how do these things happen to me? <laughs> So she calls him and says, there's a man over here who wants to talk to you. He said, okay, I'm coming up the hill. So I asked her for a hat. I asked for a hat like it. She said, I don't have a hat, but I'll walk to the SUV and get you a shirt. So she went and got me that shirt. They wasn't giving away shirts. But she went and got me this shirt given to, by her. Nice lady. And I got him to sign. <laughs> <laughs> that, that doesn't count now. Anyway, he signed this for me, and I kind of, I kind of, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get my fiddle. Uh, he signed this, and I thought it had some meaning, because it's a massage heart, you know. I took that to mean something. Okay, what I really want to talk to you about is, uh, and I know I don't talk about it much, but I, I'm in court, as you know, because of my hat. So I was in court on Wednesday, and the judge was going to think about what I had to do. But this is what we're important about. What we're important about is the coroner couldn't be there. And she said, I'm planning something out of town, and my training. Guess where she went? She went to Dearborn, Michigan, to a training about legal pathologists and all this kind of stuff. Cost about $2,200 <coughs> in Dearborn, Michigan. I call the state training. Nothing to do with that. She hadn't even been to all her classes in Georgia to go to them. So I just want you to know that I'm volunteering because I think they're going to have one in Hawaii, and I'd like to escort her over there if I'll pay for it. And I assure you, when I go there, I'm not coming back because I got plenty of relatives on Maui. So the other thing is a newspaper article. She's credited me with the judge signing an order about her doing her job. Isn't that what I've been trying to talk about for the last two years, doing her job? And Judge Emerson, our top judge, signed an order. She says in here that I had something to do with it. She called it a political complaint. I wish I could take credit for it, but before she said that, 
she got a letter in 2017 from Judge Walker to do her job. Listen, she fired the best man she had, Mr. Rogers, who was there. So all I'm trying to say is I told this man that I want to come over there and talk to him about someone who's pulling the Democratic Party down. Right. Mr. Pierce. Yes, ma'am. Your three minutes have expired. Your three minutes have expired. Okay. Okay, so just if you could just wrap up so we can finish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I thought you were going to wrap your sentence up, but thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Pierce. We'll take this thank matter under advisement. Next, we'll move on. We have um, Torian Arrington. Um, please come forward and give us your address. And our subject matter is Community Service Board. Did I pronounce your name right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, is it Torian? Yeah, it's Tar. Oh, yeah, Torian. Okay, you can give us your address, uh, state your address, and the subject matter is Community Service Board, and you have three minutes, so please. You can proceed if you just state your name again and give me your address. Yeah, my name is Tony Arrington. Uh, my address is 4323 Carolina Court, Douglasville, Georgia, 30135. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm up here today to uh, represent the uh, Choices for Douglas program out of Douglasville, Georgia. And um, we um, get out in the community and we go out and go to the park, we go to different restaurants. And um, it's just a program to help grow um, in a, um, help a person grow in developmental ways. And it's a um, disability type program for disability people and things like that. And um, it's just a program where, you know, I think it's been helping me grow and it's going to help me achieve whatever I need to achieve <coughs> out here um, to be successful. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, do you have a comment, Mr. Uh, I just want to say we are at the uh, Trust Sister Douglas, and if we, it's considered the WOW program, Windows Without Walls. I mean, <laughs> Windows Walls Without. <coughs> I'm sorry, I apologize. World but without actually, Walls. Walls Without Walls. <laughs> okay, and um, basically, what we do is we um, assist with individuals who have mild intellectual and physical disabilities. So we, for parents that do work, we do provide a daycare center that allows them to not be home alone. So that's what we are. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. We'll take this matter in advisement, and this is attached to the community <coughs> service board. Thank so. Okay. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Next, we have Miss Sharon Bouchel. Bouchel. I hope I didn't ruin your name. Bouchel. 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 Mm -hmm. Uh, please come forward. Your subject matter is Fox Hall. I'll restate your name and give us your address for the record. Sharon Bachtel at six. I live at 6331 South Skyline Drive, in the district, district 3. And before I begin, I would just like to say the board needs to consider moving the date or the day of their meeting to a day other than Monday because there's no place to park. And I think that discourages people from coming, participating, if they can't find a place to park. I had to walk them across the street. And I'm an old lady. <laughs> the thing I want to talk about is Fox Hall. I would, I'm going to read this because I think a five-hour meeting is too long and it will go faster if I read it. Yes, ma'am. The uh, transparency, transparency of this board for the Fox Hall issue has not been good. Um, why is this being rushed through? I have attended two town hall meetings this year and the subject of Fox Hall was not brought up. The work session video for the presentation was delayed and only has been available for a week. I saw no articles in Sentinel, but I didn't receive my paper Saturday, so there might have been something Saturday, I don't know. Um, I, I just, uh, I think my tax dollars paid for a $15,000 study that I have not been able to see and I really don't think I've been informed on it very much by what was um, on video. Uh, I don't really don't understand the presentation that well. Um, I just don't think the guy who did the survey adequately explained if it was a good or a bad deal. <coughs> 
I sent an email to my commissioner, but I've not received a, a reply or an acknowledgement, so I don't even know, you know, what her opinion is on it. If Fox Hall is such a good deal, then why weren't they able to get foreign or private investors in this good economy? I'm sure they did studies, just as our company did, <clears throat> as far as infrastructure, extra infrastructure, why does Fox Hall get sewers and I don't? I've lived in this county over 30 years, but they get priority over me. This business doesn't want to pay taxes for 99 years. If I understand what the uh, proposal was, that is out of line. They talked about paying squaws tax, but they based their figures on full occupancy, which won't happen every day. The businesses in Douglasville will not benefit as much as they say they will from Foxhall. Fox Hall. Most of the businesses that will benefit will be Fulton County because people will be coming from the airport. Can our roads handle any more traffic? We need to fix the roads first. I think the BOC should have informed the public better on what is happening with Foxhall, and they should say no to Foxhall demands. It is not a good deal. Thank you, sure. Ms. Thank you so much. We'll take this matter into advisement. I appreciate, uh, appreciate you coming in today. Um, next, we have Mr. John Tomaski. Mr. Tomaski, if you could please come forward, forward and give us your, uh, restate your name and give us your address. And your subject matter is, just give us your subject matter. I can't read this one out here. Home Service 101, I believe. Please, you have the floor. Oh, I thank Chairman Jones mm -hmm. and good morning to everyone. And uh, in particular to uh, Judge McClain, who uh, I personally observed several years ago to be a justice of great patience and restraint. And I would say even more so legally. Um, my subject is uh, Poli Sci 101. And uh, it provides context within which one can understand political issues, especially the real politic that goes back to Otto von Bismarck of the 1880s. And in general, individuals get involved in politics, either as elected officials or simply as party members, <coughs> to some combination of interest in the general welfare <coughs> and personal benefits, be they tangible or intangible. <coughs> and I'll leave it to you all to decide for yourselves, any given politician or party member, to what extent are they motivated by self-interest or altruism. But understand that that is the context. People are in it for a variety of reasons, and they can be more or less selfish or altruistic. The lady who just spoke, I think she has a pretty good grasp of things, even though she confessed not to being uh, in full command of the issue. She seems very astute to me, and it seems she also understands the issue of self-interest in politics. Now, in this county, uh, and in the state generally, there had been, uh, up to about a generation ago, uh, one party in power, uh, <coughs> and uh, it uh, behaved in a somewhat omnipotent way, and it really uh, brought forth its own demise. Recently, in this county, <coughs> there's been a change in power, and uh, it's obvious in three superficial ways, one, one party being a majority on the county commission to another, uh, also, um, the demographics have changed, both in terms of uh, so-called race and uh, men uh, going from the majority to the minority on the commission. And at this point, you have new people, uh, some of whom have come from hundreds of miles away, rather than the multi-generational people who had been here before. So one thing that gets into it is people who have been here for generations 
they pretty much have their boundaries of interest set. And they'll push and tug against each other, but everybody pretty much goes with the status quo. New people come in, um, they have ambition, they have a hunger, and there's a different dynamic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Janowski. I appreciate you coming in today. We'll take this matter and advise us. Last but not least, we have Ms. Darlene Shelton, um, Sheridan. Um, Ms. Darlene, please come forward, give us your address and your subject matter this morning. I'm able to read yours. It says mental health. Good morning. My name is Darlene Sheridan. I live at 3436 Springbridge Drive here in Douglasville. And I'm also here about the Community Service Board. I am the director of the Midway Community Resource Center. And our logo is Love in Action by Helping, Connecting, and Serving. <coughs> and the way we do that, we use a lot of the resources here in Douglas County. And we are proud to say that we are now the only county station of hope. The Station of Hope is set up for returning <coughs> citizens. We are interested in making sure that they're not back in jail again, going back through the revolving doors. So we're very active in seeing that we have programs available to help these type of citizens. We work closely with, with um, <coughs> Carol Chateau of Community Supervision. We work closely with Lisa Williams of the Sheriff's Department with their reentry program. And we are working with the Community Service Board. So this board is very vital to um, prevention of problems because now we have the resources available to help many citizens of all races, <coughs> genders, whatever it is. Mental health is a very serious problem. And we know one in four at least have a mental health issue of some type. So for this community service board, I'm asking that whatever funding is necessary, that we do so until the state is able to step in and to assist with the Douglas County Community Service Board. I also work with the Douglas County Task Force. I've been a volunteer on the sexual and um, um, abuse hotline for several years. So I get to see a lot of the different issues we have in this community. The Resource Center, again, is there to connect, help, and serve for Douglas County and also the city of Douglasville. So I'm asking you to really consider doing whatever is necessary that we can keep the Douglas County um, mental health services here in Douglas County. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sharon. Thank you so much. <coughs> we will take this matter under advisement, and we appreciate you. Board of Commissioners, I'm going to make a few adjustments this, so this meeting can move quickly, or should I say move, we can move along today. I want to just uh, move to tab number, uh, where it says approval of the minutes. I want you all to take a look at the minutes for tomorrow, and please uh, be sure to look at those so we can put accordingly. And then tab number four is proclaiming the month of May 2, 2019 as Mental Health Awareness Month in Douglas County. And that will be read by Ray Lightford, who is the Director of, the, of Operations for the CSB here in Douglas County. And then also I'll just, and then I'll stop here, and then I'll pivot back up to our presentations. We have two presentations today. One is Splashed Update, and that's for Terry Gable, if you could come forward. I want to do that as well. I'm just trying to see what you can do. Keep it tight. Keep it tight. Let's see. There you are. <coughs> Mr. Gable, thank you so much for coming in today. And um, we are looking sure. forward Glad to your here. presentation. Got a little concern we wouldn't be able to fire it up there for a minute. Thank you. My name is Terry Gable. I'm with Moore on Altabelli. I'll be doing a splice update for the May report. Uh, David Good will be doing a short presentation on vendors, if time permitting, okay. uh, at the end of the presen my presentation, and we'll uh, <coughs> give you a quick uh, update for the vendors. Uh, so with that, this is May 1st report, so I'll be reporting on the March revenues uh, and also the work through April for the SPLOS program. Um, this is our normal SPLOS uh, pie chart showing the, the total um, invoice amount for um, through April. So out of 100, the $100 million program, we're right at $25 million that's been invoiced out. Uh, it's around 25% of the work. 
uh, as we move into uh, the beginning of SPLOS year three in April. And if you break that down by program element, um, the fire and EMS is around 13.8 million um, that shares in that, that's been invoiced out. Transportation's at 7.3 million and parks and recs at right at 1.7 million. So when looking at our revenues, we um, <clears throat> continue to see some pretty solid numbers coming in and we were fortunate and we ended the uh, splash year two with um, a good uh, a good revenue amount. Uh, it ended March it ended up being the third highest for the splash year two. We were right at about $2.3 million. Um, so that was a good end to it and this, it'll obviously be a good, a good uh, start for splash year three. And I'll just go through the totals with you. So um, <clears throat> both Splash Tier 1 and Splash Tier 2, we collected about $49.3 million, um, which will, uh, uh, provides us with an overage of about $1.2 million as we go into Splash Tier 3. Uh, hopefully we can maintain that and the, the revenues will stay up and the economy will continue to be uh, progressing and <laughs> folks getting out and spending some money. And if we just look at uh, Splash Tier 2, which really did help the program out, um, all the numbers came in fairly solid. We had a couple months that were flat, um, which was a little bit odd. It was actually through some of the, the holidays. Um, but we ended the, the hard number for the March was 2.66 million. Um, if you compare the, the total revenues with the projections for the for year two, we were about $1.6 million, $6 million over for the, for the revenues. So, Good news as we go into again our third year of the SPLOS program. And I left this up so for uh, we made the, the final payment for SPLOS year two on the bond obligation $16.3 million that was made in April. Um, as we move into SPLOS year three, I'll, I'll show those new numbers up at, at our, my next report. And uh, that'll be our highest, pay, highest payment for the for the repayment on the on the payment obligation. It'll be around $20 million for spots year three. Of course, that'll affect our pay-go money as we <coughs> move through the, through the year. And then giving some quick updates on the, the projects themselves. Uh, here's the <coughs> projects that have been completed for, for the chief. Really no change from, um, from our last report. We will be adding uh, fire station three. Um, hopefully next month, it, we've got the crew in and uh, everything should be lined up to get that project completed totally. Uh, and I'll just give a quick, quick update on that when I get to it. Um, the countywide digital radio system is, is on schedule. I'm glad to report. Um, we're, still, we're still holding on to the October um, 31st deadline for the year. Uh, Motorola's uh, at this point thinks they can hit that target date. Uh, we had the last three parcels that, that, that slowed the project down as far as getting all the site towers completed. Uh, six of the nine towers are, are completely done. Uh, the three that, that were remaining uh, took a little bit more time in trying to get the paperwork negotiated out with those. Um, two of those sites are under construction. It's all steel gas and factory shows. And then the one that we, we have not started on is the one down at South Douglas. Uh, we're in, uh, at this point, we're at the, final, the final stage of it is to get CHIPO approval for it. Uh, that's, uh, from what I'm hearing from Drake Roberts with, with Motorola. Um, everything's looking positive for that. One good news is, is once they get an, uh, an agreement from them, everything's worked out, they can start work, and then the final paperwork can, can be done at a, at a later date. So we're all, um, again, we're on schedule with the project. At some point, um, I'll be getting Motorola in here to give us a, a more in the weeds update on where they're at. And I think I'll wait till we're a little bit closer to finalizing all the nine sites uh, to kind of hit that milestone date. So I'm thinking that's probably going to be either next month, um, no later than July. I'll get him in here and give a good update. And, and Jay's going to want to show some pictures, I'm sure, of all the good work they've done. So real quick, moving through some equipment for the chief, uh, the ambulance, we got one ambulance for 2019. Um, it's, uh, it's been piggybacked on last year's contracts. So it's, it's already been ordered. And then the, we got one fire truck for 2019, and that 
the proposal for advertising will be going out in June uh, for um, proposals back in all the fire trucks. So those are those are moving uh, as we would expect. And then finally, uh, station three renovations. Uh, the crew has moved back into the building. Um, just doing some final touch-ups, uh, looking at getting possibly some new furnishings in the building. That's the main thing going on now is some small touch-ups from the contractor. So everything's looking good there. And I mentioned to, to the board previously that we're planning on, a, and David Good is working with Rick and doing a, a ribbon cutting on fire, on fire Station 3 sometime over the next couple, two or three weeks. So we're looking forward to that and getting that, that building completely done and, and letting, it, letting the Chiefs crew take full control over it. Uh, staff vehicles is three trucks that, that were on the Chiefs list for the 2019. One's been ordered and they're in the process of, of specking out the other two and we'll get those ordered as well. I've got Station 9 up here as you know that as far as the construction of Station 9 we've got that programmed out a couple years but we are um, we're all moving forward with engaging uh, Alan Bell who was the architect who did the original design for it, they did some elevation plans for it for the chief to start getting some uh, ideas on what they wanted. Uh, we're going to be meeting back with them uh, soon to make sure they understand completely what we're looking for in the in Station 9, and, and then we'll be getting some calls for them to give us an actual design work. So it's possible we could be uh, looking at doing the design uh, for the fire station this year, um, and then we'll once we get it designed, then we can start getting some hard numbers on estimates and making sure we know exactly what we need to put this in the overall program. And then with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. That wraps up the fire for now. Any questions? No. No. Fire? Not at this time. Keep moving. Moving into transportation, there's the, uh, again, there's the projects that have been completed. And no change for McGill as we as we move into the, in the, in the June, May and June. Uh, so the resurfacing program, CW, CW Matthews was awarded uh, the 2019 resurfacing for this year. Mm -hmm. um, they did, they were able to get started early, uh, much earlier than last year. Um, one of the big projects on the on their list was Lee Road. Uh, the rehab of Lee Road and resurfacing that work was done, completed within about a week and a half. So they did a good job and got in and did a, a, a road that was certainly necessary and, and needed to be done as quickly as possible, as bad a shape as it was in. Um, so they'll complete, uh, continue doing their, their resurfacing. They have pulled out, but they'll be back in what uh, Miguel's telling me in uh, July. We'll see them back in here and finishing out. Uh, in 2019, we did combine our LMIG and our splash list. So it's a fairly big contract this year, around $5.9 million, million. So it was a, it was a nice, sizable um, resurfacing contract. <coughs> the payment evaluations uh, are going on very well. We have um, made some good progress when the weather finally broke. We've got districts four, three, and are completed basically. And District 2 is about 50% complete. Uh, we're hoping uh, to get the, the rest of the remaining field work done over yeah, probably during the month of June. And then we'll be uh, working with Miguel on the program and developing it, developing everything that that program can put out uh, in July and then wrapping everything up towards the end of July. So we're on progress there. Uh, everything's going well. I got a few things that come up and nothing major that we'll be working with Miguel on to, to get, get everything ironed out with it. Stewart Mill Road um, design is ongoing. We are very close, and um, Jacobs is very close in getting the plans completely done for this. We'll probably move into June with that, and then they'll be focusing on getting right-of-way plans finalized for Miguel. Um, Miguel staff to go out and start right-of-way purchases on it. Uh, that's that's probably going to take a three, be a three or four month progress. We're thinking, um, so we're we're looking for for this project to be let sometime in the fall depending on the, the complications and difficulties in, in, in getting all the right way acquired for it. But the good news is it is moving moving forward and we hope to see it uh, uh, get out for construction towards the end of the year. And Bright Star Road at John West, this project um, 
It'll be one of the two that will, um, Miguel's telling me that he's on track right now getting left in June. Um, all the right of way's been purchased on it, and Miguel's just finalizing what he needs to get the project set up for a living. And then the other one that will be letting in June, uh, both these needed projects and, and long awaited is Sweetwater Church. This is the one where we partnered with Paulding County um, and with uh, getting this project let Paulding County to design on it and Douglas County be uh, putting it out for bid. Um, and also the calls were split between the two counties. But this project's ready to go and Miguel's got that in his queue to, to let that in, in June also. So Chapel Hill Road intersection, this is our bigger uh, project for intersection improvements that we are working on. Uh, it's being designed by SEI. We had an a, a open house public information meeting um, just a couple weeks ago, April 23rd. Had a great turnout. I think a lot of people interested in, in the project, obviously. And SEI was there, and Miguel did a good job of presenting that. Uh, so we, we needed that to make sure we, we got full input from the from the people living on the roadway. We had a, uh, Miguel had a, uh, some visuals of the typical section for the roadway. As far as the getting their comments back, now that we've got that done, uh, that was the target that SEI needed to move forward. We, they now know uh, what they need as far as the final design on it, and they'll move into full design for utilities right away in the roadway. Um, and then we'll be designing that probably through the fall, and then hopefully about the end of the year, before that, get Miguel the right away plans and they may be able to express that's going to be a, that project's going to be one of the long ones as far as acquiring the uh, the number of parcel that's going to take to get that to get that third lane in and out through there. So we're just moving along at, at, at this point as expected. Um, the Highway Five project, Douglas Boulevard. This is the right turn lane, the north right northbound right turn lane on Five at Douglas Boulevard. Again, a much needed project. Um, uh, we've got, uh, Miguel went out for uh, proposals for design consultants to come in and, and assist with with uh, several projects actually that he's going to be using them for. This will be one of them as soon as he gets and, uh, those uh, contracts finalized, a notice to proceed issue. This will be the first ones. I'm sure Miguel's got any, uh, that he'll be given and get started with this project to get it designed. Once we get it designed, the main thing with this project is going to be knowing the right of way impact and the utility impact, those will be the two big factors with it. Obviously, it's just the right turn lane, but it's it's in a very busy inter, uh, intersection, as most of you know, and the, the utilities in the right away are gonna be fairly expensive. Post Road Bridge at Dog River, no change here. Um, contractor still working his way towards Douglas County. Miguel is, um, he keeps up updating us on a small parcel that's come up that he's working with uh, G dot on it, trying to get it settled. It doesn't sound like it's too complicated, um, so hopefully that will get resolved very, uh, fairly soon. And obviously, we have time with the contractor um, working his way towards Douglas. So not, we're thinking he's going to be towards the end of the year. Miguel's thinking he'll have that. He'll have that parcel um, uh, closed by then. And getting into our, our sidewalk projects, I know these we, we're still pushing SEI to get these projects done. Um, they're smaller projects, but as, as most any transportation project, they, they, there's always a process we got to go through. Um, the the design is basically completed. Uh, we're what we're we're meeting with Miguel next Tuesday to to look at the finer details of. We have a couple parcels that were impacted uh, for right of way, and we've got some easements that are going to be needed. Uh, we're going to try to fine tune that, but we're oh, but basically in the right of way phase here with this. Once we get through next Tuesday, and Miguel can get some more uh, uh, definitive direction to SEI, uh, we'll be moving into getting these projects completely designed and getting the right of way. Uh, hopefully, there won't be any what what we possibly we can ask some things through the contract to, to reduce the right of way impact. Um, so both of these will be. Um, I'm still thinking of June. June letting again, depending on on the, the, the amount of right of way, and then the last the last one that's, that we're currently working on of the three right, the sidewalk projects is New Manchester High School on 92. There's no right of way that's that we've got to acquire out there or easements. The biggest thing there is, and I've mentioned in the past, is we have to do a PED study 
Uh, we had to get SEI to do a PET study. That was done last week, which was fairly critical because of the time of the school. It needed to be done when school was in. Um, and then that will be submitted to GDOT for an encroachment permit. So that will be the one thing out there that will slow that project down. Is it will have to work through GDOT's um, utility office to get the encroachment permit. Once that's done, uh, this project will be ready to go out for bid too. The Whitestone culvert, uh, the, the contractor is, has been uh, awarded the, uh, the contract. Obviously, we're waiting on the final paperwork and those proceed to be given to him. And then there will be a pre-construction meeting and uh, they'll get started with, again, a, a much needed culvert to go in out there. It's been out for several years. Um, this is the uh, the safety projects that we, one of the safety projects that we broke out in the front from uh, Anna Wakey. Uh, this will be just identified in various locations, including I-20 ramps to go in and add some, uh, add some lighting in, in the areas. I think one here is fairly dark at night. Um, so we're working with, uh, right now, Greystone and, and Georgia Power to get some cost in for that. Once those come in, we'll be able to develop a scope and, a, and, and, and look, at, look and see where we're at as far as dollar-wise, and hope we'll be able to get some of those going pretty quick here. All the way down into a Mount Vernon uh, road. This is the one where we need a bad, badly needed intersection for a traffic signal. Uh, we've been in Aunt and Miguel and Mark both ongoing uh, discussions with GDOT. Uh, paperwork has been submitted for um, for a project with them, to partner with them to do a, a signal there. We're just we're trying to work with that and get that uh, expedited as quick as we can and get it approved. Hopefully GDOT is sharing some of the cost and we'll get that signal up. Um, we just got to get uh, get some target dates from GDOT and <clears throat> see exactly where they're at with it. And then the highway down into Ripside Parkway uh, and signal, and th this will really depend on what uh, what's feasible or what uh, what the warrants will show out there. But this will be another project like the Highway Five at uh, Douglas Boulevard that Miguel will will tap into the, some of the the who's ever awarded, which consultants awarded the uh, design uh, contracts. And this will be another project that he'll get them on and do a feasibility study, uh, try to determine exactly what's needed out there and what can be done and still meet GDOT warrants for the, for the, uh, for the intersection. And our Lee Rook Road widening project, um, which again has a long history with GDOT, uh, right now the, the Project's basically ready to go with right away in plans, and we're looking for GDOT to, to confirm up funding years for it. Um, Douglas County has their match that we we're committing uh, right now, eleven million dollars out of supplies money, and then once GDOT confirms a funding year, Miguel will be ready. I'm sure set to go to, to get that project lit. We're thinking now either 2020 or 2021 is what we're expecting from GDOT. <coughs> and that finishes up transportation. Any questions at this point? We're going to wait to the end of okay. the presentation. Yeah. Let's keep going. Uh, parks, that's the completed projects. Again, no change there. And hopefully, again, like the fire with, with the chief, we'll be adding the Boundary Waters Concession Building uh, in, in the next report. The uh, the concession uh, building out of Bangor <coughs> now is basically completed. Um, integrated is just doing some final, just some final things inside. They, they were landscaping last week, uh, so that tells you the project's pretty much done. Uh, Greystone has finally got its power out here several weeks ago, so we're good to go there. That project will be wrapping. It'll be wrapping up within um, probably this week or next week, um, and hopefully we'll be looking at possibly ribbon cutting on this project too. And then the, the adjacent project that we had with that was the Boundary Water Soccer Field Lights. Um, those have been done. Uh, Georgia, uh, West Georgia uh, Lighting <coughs> finished those projects early in the, in the year, and we were just waiting on Greystone to get the power out there, which they've done. <coughs> All I've got to do now is get the test set up but with Musco for the lights, and this project will be ready to turn back to turn over to the county. Um, 
and activated in fields. So Dillick um, Park Tennis Courts, we're moving forward and the board approved uh, last month for integrated to, to do the demo work out there. So we're going to move forward with uh, going out and removing the old tennis courts and getting the old buildings out and, and stabilize that area. Uh, we're finalizing the design. I'm, uh, Carter Watkins telling me they should have the project, the design on it, finished this uh, going, going into June. Uh, we're going to put that project out for bid and see where the bids come in. <coughs> right now it's looking like, based on some early um, cost estimates, that we're going to be over what was budgeted. So we talked with Mark and, and, and Gary uh, last week, and it's the best decision we came up with right now is to go ahead and put this project out for bid and just see where we're at um, to make sure we know exactly what the what the construction cost would be on it. So we'll go ahead and demo it, get it designed, and then we'll get it out on the street for a bit to see where the, where the bids come in at. Uh, the multi-purpose rec center um, is in the final stages of design. Glad to report that. Um, Sutton Architects is telling us probably the end of June, July. We're just working through some final details with him um, on the um, some of the, the security system and, and items like that, um, getting those details worked out. So and this is keeping us on schedule for what we thought we'd finish the design in June or July. Uh, we're still showing a July 31st, 2020 completion date on yet. And the, uh, the senior center is right behind it. Um, they're, they're just about tag team. Uh, so we'll have two nice projects that will be on the street uh, late summer. Um, it, this one may be let before, not as big a building, this one may be let before the rec center. But again, Carter Watkins is in the final stages with this, um, doing the same thing. We're working through the IT and, and the audio video uh, details of buildings. And once we get those details worked out, we'll be ready to put them, on the, put them out on the, on the street. Uh, the Guild Art and Fair Play Concession Building you remember both these projects were right now we have bid out, we just bid out the, the concession buildings for both these parks. Um, we are, we've got bids in, we've got had some good bids, uh, uh, probably some awardable bids based on budget, but the, they're still under review. They'll be presented to the parks committee uh, and, and re recommendations come out of there uh, to make some final decisions on moving forward with that. Obviously the Deer Lick Park <coughs> Tennis Courts um, is it another one we need, we need to get to a point where we got a bid on it too to look at look and see how it's impacting our budget. <clears throat> so those are those bids are in. And then finally, I think this is the last one is the Fair Play Park lights, which this work was completed. It's been completed. Um, <coughs> we're waiting on as we did at Boundary uh, Soccer Field lights, waiting on Braystone to, to set that transformer. The county's done everything we needed to do as far as easements and applications. They've got all that. Uh, once they get the transformer set and we can we can uh, get power on the lights, we'll, we'll fire those up and test them just like we're doing at the ones at uh, um, Boundary Water. So with that, we can, I can take questions on my part. Okay, Board of Commissioners, we have some questions. Vice Chairman Robson, I see your hand. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll be very quick. I, I recognize that I've got a pretty long session, um, so duly noted. Uh, real quick, I want to back up um, to the numbers. Um, you know, and I appreciate our, our uh, one for our citizens being here and giving their comments earlier. Um, I, again, uh, I do hear, and to the broader community um, who approved this floss, um, is greatly appreciated. Which is why I'm going to draw this comparison, because um, uh, one of our citizens provided a great context for history. Currently in this current spot, and weigh in on this, so I'm going to take you, be quick, but I'm going to take you through this. You said $2.3 million is what we um, generated in March. Is that accurate? That's correct. Right. All right. All right. And Michelle, you're here. All right. You're in the number one spot today because Jennifer Hallman, our director, is not here. So flow with me for a minute. All right. So the 2009 spot, um, if I recall, is what, about 1.75 is what we need to pay off the bond every month, like a month? Is that our bogey? I believe so. Something like that. All right. What is the current amount that we, what is our current bond structure that we need to pay? We 
Well, 1.3. All right, so listen, 1.7 is the last boss back in 2009. We spent $120 million on a jail, followed with 175. This one is same amount of money, give or take. We're going to talk about the different categories. And we're saying we only had to hit, what, 1.3. All right, very good. All right. With that being said, though, the question becomes, okay, but what do we get for our dollars? Right? So this is, this is for those who have been here a long time and for those who are here new. It's about the exchange, all right? So if I compare it, and if we look, the largest thing we've got on there is what probably the, um, is a single item, is what, the, the tower at about the what? The tower's the radio. About 12 million, give or take? 15 million. 15, 15. 15 million, then followed by what, the community center, senior center, I think our, our appropriation for economic development is probably about 10 million, give or take, right? All right, last loss, we spent $10 million on 29 acres for that jail. $10 million for 29 acres. Now, for that same dollar, <coughs> what? I can put a tower up, community center up, senior center, etc. This is important for the current citizens who voted for this lost. Right? That jail didn't make us safer. It didn't increase our quality of life. It made 800 people comfortable. I appreciate our, our, our law enforcement. They deserve a better office, no problem, all day long. But this is important. Like, but every now and then it's like, okay, I get all that stuff when you're so internally focused on government. And I want y'all to be critical of us as, as leaders. Like, everything can't be about government. It can't be about new toys for staff. It can't be, every now and then you want to experience your tax dollars on a daily basis. I want to see it. I want to experience it. So, which is why I appreciate Commissioner Mitchell who helped us really shape what this current SPOS was about. We had too much concentration in, in maybe transportation. He watered it down. He increased it for parks, right? Look at where your dollars are going, right? How, how do your families relate to the dollars that are being spent? We'll talk later about some of the other, some of the things that are pending, but this is important to understand where your dollars are. All right, so let me get to my question. I want to just give context. So, all right, so back to roads. Um, you're rating the roads. You said that you've done District 4, the largest, um, District 4 has the largest um, um, geographical area of yes. all four commission districts, right? It's pretty much raw land, all future, I've got the most dense, I'm far east, that's far west, okay. So you've done that, you've done us, um, but District 3, District. haven't quite got to my colleague um, um, from the first district yet. All right, so here's my question, and Miguel is in here. What would it take to pave every road in this county? And will this study give me that number? In other words, it's great that, again, we've got great equipment, great everything, but the citizens, like the late said, well, what would it take to put sewer in my yard? Now, I know everybody don't want it. Some people want to stay remain rural. But everybody don't want to remain rural. I mean, I don't mind being rural, but can I at least get some water and sewer out here that's not on the septic? Can I get, like, can I get a little upgrade? All right, so everything is not far right. Sometimes things are right center. All right, follow me. All right, so Miguel. Yes, sir. All right, you're here. All right, Miguel, weigh in for me. Uh, will this project give us um, uh, answer the question? Uh, first of all, how many road do we have in the county? If you know how many roads, how many center miles, and will this study that we did by amending our contract with Worland, which was the right thing to do? They come up with, I mean, not just when I hear people say, well, why is it always District 2? Why? Well, I mean, I advocated for that, but that's okay. But the question is, now we're going to advocate for everybody, right? So since sometimes we, we pause sometimes on advocacy, let's advocate for the whole thing. What would it take? Okay. The, this exercise, this yes. analysis, will put us in a position to know what the cost of doing the entire county is. <coughs> Now, I don't have that figure in my head yet because part of the analysis is going to be looking at roads that are in no bad condition and say, okay, those roads need to be reconstructed. It will look at roads that are in better condition and say, well, those you can do some preventative maintenance on. So there's going to be a mixture of different types of approaches, different remedies for the conditions out there. But I can tell you this, we have over 700 miles of roads in the county. 
a typical county of this size, if you if you were able to put about say ten to twelve million dollars into resurfacing, it would take you twenty to twenty five years to go through the county. If that puts you in perspective. So it is a massive amount of funding. The infrastructure, you're, you're close to a billion dollars worth of infrastructure that we're talking about. Okay. All right, so let me make sure. All right, so if it took you for Lee Road, if it takes two and a half miles, to just easy math, two and a half miles, we know that costs what, about half a million, right? 600. All right, make it half a million, make it easy for me. Okay. But easy math. So I know you, you had to reinforce it because of the density, okay? But so half a million dollars. So half a million dollars, two and a half. So 10 miles equals what? Um, two million? Did I do that right? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm accurate. Two million. Four times five is two million. So for 10 miles, and now we got to get up to 700 miles, all right? So I'm, I'm thinking, oh, you're talking about a big number. Ooh. I came up with a hundred million. That's ballpark figure just to resurface. Mm -hmm. That doesn't include patching. Oh, doesn't see. include yeah. uh, milling. Doesn't right. include. Right. 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 So we just that's just a that's hundred million. So that's a jail for one hundred twenty. All the roads in the county, same number. All in recognizing we haven't filled it in. It's about priorities. Priorities. Everybody in this county, no matter how much you pay in sales tax, property tax, you can have your road paved. It's based on priority of your elected officials. We made this an important part of our administration to pave roads. They were negligible. I get calls from my citizens like, Mr. Robinson, don't want that lead road. I've been out here for 40 years. I can tell y'all how long y'all. Y'all ain't never did it. <coughs> I get it. Right, there is history here. But it's also, I just wanted, and I'm, this is my only point, I only want to talk about this, which is roads are important. Infrastructure, whether it's at the federal <coughs> level or the local level. We're saying, look, we've, we're going to do our part with what we got. We can't do it all, we ain't going to do it all in our administration, at least, at least not my term um, during this time period, because as you say, we can't swallow that whole thing in one time. Uh, but we can make a good chunk at it. We, we can do it. We, like, we ask the citizens to be patient. We're coming. We're lining it up. We're setting priorities. We did this road rating. That was important. I hear sometimes we people ask, well, why do you spend money on studies? Well, that makes our quality of our decisions better. Get input. We're, we're not gods. We're not deities. We, we've got to go around and we've got to get experts in here so we can make wise decisions. So it costs money for professionals. But at the end of the day, we want to make it a better place for everyone. We, we've got to do this right. And I do appreciate staff and I mean, working with the rigor that this administration is under, but it is appreciative. And I just had to make that statement because we don't want it, I know this gets long, but it's important. That's where your money is being spent. And so we have to be accountable. So that was it. I just wanted one thing, Madam Chair, I yield to my colleagues. Thank you. Anybody else or any, any other comments from the board commissioners? <coughs> oh, oh, Commissioner Guyton. Just uh, one question, one quick question. Why is it taking so long for uh, Greystone to the, the, uh, the, well, hook up the lines. Power. Yes. It, when it's a process, just like we described, it's like the roads, but it, it's, um, I don't know if I can answer that. It, it is a matter of getting them, you know, making their first initiative contact with them, which we did at both those fields at Boundary and at Fair Play, and getting their, their, the, the, the engineer that carries that region down to the site, and he looks at it, he makes some preliminary judgments on it, and then you got you got to work through the process. And in both these cases, we had to get easements, and that that's just a, it just adds a little bit of time. There's not that much to them, but it, you know it has to go before the board. Uh, and they have to be approved. It has to be approved, and then it's and then it's got to be sent back to Greystone. They have to schedule a crew to come back out. So they've been it's been averaging about two or three months. To, to work through from the time we initiate contact with them and say that we need we're gonna need a new transformer here for this new building. It's been it's been two or three months uh, to get through that process. Do you think that it will be done before fall ball comes into play? Um yeah yes the, the lights I'm expecting uh, Grayson out there any day now. Everything they've had it now uh, 
the actual work will take but just a day or two. Um, but yes, I fully expect those the lights to be powered up. Now you may have a, you may have a building under construction. Um, something that Gary and I'll need to be uh, working with very closely here that with this close with those bids. Um, but we got that same situation with Bill Art too. So. And on the concession stand, how long do you think it will take to uh, construct the concession so stands? Both of those buildings, um, from indications we got from the bids, were, um, were five months for both, both buildings. So it is going to run into the next season, the ball season. Have y'all made any, uh, is the county, and maybe I'll to direct this to get are we making some kind of uh, plans? Yeah. So that they will yes. have some kind of uh, concession stand and restrooms and stuff like that. Yes, we've been this talking with them and discussing the schedule with them and what their alternatives would be. All right, so they they're aware yes, that they're going to have to have some kind of temporary yes. uh, uh, concession stand and restroom. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. I yield back. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mitchell. <coughs> Just a couple. Of so you mentioned that uh, we have one of the highest uh, in March uh, with the third highest, third highest mm -hmm. for the year for the spots year two. Right. And what was that number? That was it one point two or something. Uh, it's two oh. point round up a little bit. Two point three. Two point three. <coughs> March revenue came in. But that put us in the, in the, in the group, I guess the green. Oh yeah. yeah for sure. For um, well, with looking at both spots years now combined <coughs> as we move into right. third year. Uh, we're about 1.3 million dollar overage. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's a, that's a great look, and I and I continue to encourage our um, citizens to kind of continue to shop <laughs> and buy more. <laughs> okay. But my other question, though, let's go to the digital radio side of things. Uh, my first question, though, I know we looked at <coughs> budget of about 15 mil. I think it was 16 mil or somewhere in that ballpark. How are we looking, even with Six of the, even with six of the nine towers uh, done, or, or, or how, how are we looking budget wise? Are we still coming in under budget? I know we, did, we made some adjustments because there were a few things that was unforeseen that we didn't, that the, that the chief brought to our attention somewhere down the road. But how are we looking at that 15 mil? We We're still, still in the black. We, okay. we have eaten into that. Uh, there was about, a, I'm going to say roughly a million dollars we've added. You know, they've given us some credits and we've, we've added some things. Right. We did into it a little bit, but not, not too much. Right, so we still we still uh, got a, possibly up some, some dollars that are going to be returned back. Maybe yes, not at this point. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, okay, good. And that particular one tower that we've got further out west um, with the pastor, please explain to us kind of where we are with that and, and how, I mean, I know you said we're going to move forward, but kind of share with the public kind of how we're going to move with that. So we were able to to get a site. Um, you know, that was a second choice, I think, Mark. Wasn't that correct? Yes. Yeah. So that, that that's again, that that's been probably our little sticker point right. with it. But right. uh, at, at the point we're at right now, uh, Motorola has went through several of the permits already, mm -hmm. but the Shippo the historical uh, is what's remaining right now, mm -hmm. um, and it is infected. It's impacting some of the uh, the equipment. Uh, that some changes they're having, they're asking them to do. So there's some negotiation going on between the county, Motorola, and, and, and SHPO. Um, the good news is, and it's, you know, obviously it's held it up to this point so far, is that the heat feels very, J. Nix feels very good. They're very close to, to agreeing on everything. Mm -hmm. um, and that once they do that, uh, the actual the process to work through all that is going to take uh, some time, but they'll allow them to go ahead and start work. Yeah, which so is what he's looking for. He's ready. He's, he's ready to go. He's in the agreement with church. All that's been put. Okay, yeah. we finished all that. Yeah. So, so even though we've got somewhat of a hiccup, but there's nothing that's going to yeah. that's going to throw the project off. Because my at least our anticipation is that this project will be hopefully started to be tested and or up and operational roughly when. Um, so we hope to start testing it in August. Is it target late? Mm -hmm. That would mean all the towers are completed by then. Um, uh, hundred percent completed, and then they'll start start the testing. The chief can back to the <coughs> if you want to, but but we're still the, the final target date for it to be completed is November first, and that yeah. Jay keeps uh, I think reassuring us that he's on track to do that. And we're pretty much ahead of schedule based on even with the tower situation, right? Yeah, he he said it, that, that 
in all his, of his experience with having to deal with actually acquiring properties like this, mm -hmm. they've moved very well compared, you know, based on the experience he's had in, in Douglas County, and they have been able to move through the through the uh, uh, the right way parcels, and, and it just you know, that's obviously a lengthy process. Yes, and it's it, it has not it's not held him up. He's held the same schedule, and still was able to get through that. So it's. Um, <coughs> He's, he's still very positive about it and everything's on track. Good, good. Uh, the Dillick project, uh, the tennis courts, um, if, I'm, if I heard you correctly, we're going to go in and demolish the tennis courts. We're moving forward with that. With that part of it. Mm -hmm. While at the same time looking at someone to uh, rebuild and, and, and put, that, put it all back together and, and hope that the numbers fit within the numbers that we've all discussed. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, we hired Cardinal. Cardin Watkins to design it. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got with the, and there's a few other things out there <coughs> required that, but they, they should get the design completed in June, mm -hmm. and then we're, we're going to put it, we're going to put it out for good. Got it. So, and we'll have a hard, you know, a hard number. We know exactly what we've got to deal with, right? Um, and see if, if need need to what options we may have if we need to do some. And, and just for the general pu general public purpose, please <coughs> explain. I don't know if Gary might want to explain this as well why we went that route versus having it repaired the tennis courts i don't know who wants to kind of speak toward that i know we, and this just i mean i know but i want the public to understand why we took this route. they they were just in such disarray mm -hmm. in not only the lights uh, but the fencing mm -hmm. and the courts themselves mm -hmm. they had such large cracks in them mm -hmm. that if we tried to do any patching those cracks would just reoccur mm -hmm. so we we basically would be trolling good money after bad. Mm -hmm. We had tried to uh, piecemeal it, if you would, or patch. Right. Uh, it was it was not a good option. Right. So it, 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 it was more cost efficient to take this route to just demolish them, rebuild them back up. And well, I don't know about cost efficient, but right. it, it's definitely the best <coughs> plan because right. uh, it's going to cost obviously more money uh, to rebuild the entire complex, yes. mm -hmm. but we would have not got a good result if we'd have tried to patch those large cracks or resurface because they would reoccur. So we'd be coming back, repatching right. and repairing again. So I, Absolutely. I, I call it cost efficient to kind of do it. Yes, I, okay. I agree with that. Okay. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, and last but not least, okay, the community center and uh, the senior citizen center, you spoke about kind of where we are with that and mm -hmm. uh, we're ahead of schedule. Are we still ahead of schedule where we could be <coughs> operational <coughs> first quarter of next year, 2020, or? Uh, it probably first quarter, second, first or second quarter. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so we, uh-oh. What, 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 <coughs> not operational. Uh, yeah, that. It's a year build out. Okay. They're saying a year ago. Yeah, operational. You know what that is? third quarter. Got it. Okay. Okay. As far as having staff and, and fully operational. Right. Got it. But, but we're, we're, we're getting closer. I mean, we're, we're a little bit off time wise. Uh, but Not much. We, I mean, as far as what uh, timeline that we had set initially, I, I've really been real pleased. Uh, so, as far as the design on them, we're going to hit pretty much where we thought we would be. <coughs> And then with the projections of the time of how long it's going to take to build them, mm -hmm. get the build out, you are around you are around June or July. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then it, it's going it will take some time to get get it up and operational. Depending on weather. Got it. Got it. Got it. <coughs> and last but not least, I know that's going to be my last one, but this mm -hmm. sidewalk projects. Mm -hmm. uh, did I miss that, or because of I'm, I'm sure I, did, did we talk about the sidewalk projects? Yeah. Right? Where um, are we with those sidewalk projects? So and, I, and that again, I, we I've been working with SEI. They they're doing a the design on them. They they pushed them and made them realize you know these are we want to get these on on the ground. These are small projects. You know, express right. to them. They're more concerned with that. Um, so they they have finished the design on it. The, the design is there. Mm -hmm. We're meeting with Miguel next Tuesday. Um, but just because of the nature of the areas and where the sidewalks going, other than the high school. It's just about impossible to do it without some type, some form of temporary easement. And right now, they're showing a little bit of sliver of right away on both Chestnut and um, and Lithia Springs. We're going to look at that and see if we can't even try to uh, reduce that impact of nothing. Um, after the meeting Tuesday, I'm hoping we're 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 going to be even closer to getting this project out and getting it bid. I know it's been a lengthy process. But yes, but, uh, <laughs> it is. It is a process. Um, and then again, I. I 
once you do the urban <coughs> sections in these these areas that haven't been touched, it's all it's just difficult to do it without. So so we're looking for that. we're looking for some easement concerns right now. That's where we are. Yeah, temporary easements. Right, I, temporary I, I don't easements. Don't know if we're gonna be able to get around those. Right, right. So so we, we're working on that, Miguel. I guess or yes, sir. Okay, and we're we're trying to eliminate the, uh, the need for easements, and, and sometimes you can incorporate <coughs> certain uh, elements into the plan itself. Mm -hmm. It costs you a little more to do that, but then you're able to get over the property, the private property. That's our goal. So that's we're going to have a meeting to discuss. And I don't mean to be dumbfounded. So how, how do you eliminate it though by you know, well, shifting and shifting? Well, you the you could sometimes uh, install a a buffer wall, or you, know, you may have the sidewalk going up against the wall, mm -hmm. rather than adjusting the grade on the property behind it. Got it. Got it. So elements like that that uh, may cost more on the construction side. Mm -hmm. But it get us away from having to negotiate the price for the easement with the property right. owner. Just adds time to it. Got it. And and with that being said, though, let's say we took Plan B. Mm -hmm. um, any ideas? Have you guys thought about any potential cost if Plan B is the route we take? Potential cost. That's what we're going to be discussing on Tuesday. What the implication would be okay. of incorporating certain elements into the plan. All right. Thank you. And job well done. I guess I'll wait for <coughs> David's good his presentation. I may have a question or two from there, but I would yield back at the point. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gable. We appreciate sure. your presentation. And next we have a yeah, uh, follow up with Mr. Good, who's our Director of Communications for the SWATS. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good uh, morning. My name is David Good. I'm the uh, Communications Director for um, the SWATS. And right here, um, as you see, the only thing that's different is. I did not change the date to the bottom. Um, the date is as of <laughs> April 30th, 2019, not February 28th. Um, as you see, we have a total number of vendors of 82. 29 of them are within the um, within the county. 25 are right outside the county. And then you have another 12 that's within the state of Georgia. And then the rest of 16 are out of the state of Georgia. Right now, we have 56 active, uh, 56 uh, projects. 28 of them are active. 28 of them are completed. Um, what you guys want to look at is that in order to make a project active, it's once the PO has been established. Mm -hmm. Even though some, um, somebody might actually get the contract, we don't consider active on this <coughs> end until the uh, PO has been ordered. Uh, right now, we're looking at. Let's see, make sure I get that chart. Okay, cool. Get that uh, right now, we're looking at the way that we're doing everything is that you guys really put an emphasis on making sure we get local participation into this class. Now we want to make sure that we also got minority participation as well. So right now we're looking at, even though 65% of this plus is from our side, from inside the county within 30 uh, miles, so 37% of them are actually going towards on the money coming towards the county. So we're still trying to make sure we have that one increased. Um, and right now we actually have, these are the amounts inside of Douglas County. We're spending about 1.3 million for everyone in Douglas County. Right outside of Douglas County is by 11.1 million. And then when you think about the total vendors, all that is a little bit over 12. Um, for outside the state, right now we are looking at spending about 18 million. 16 million of that is going towards Motorola. Mm -hmm. And that number is only based upon what was first was budgeted, then we brought that number down to a little bit over 15 million because that amount is what they end up coming in as a purchase order. So once the purchase order is done, once they're completed, that number will, of course, end up coming down. And a new chart that we'll start putting out will actually be on active projects. I kept it like this as long as Motorola was in because it would skew it if I ended up putting that one out there. And of course, right now, we are engaging. We always make sure we go to chamber events, talk to local businesses, and let them know, make sure you participate, having actually uh, classes out there, letting people know. Make sure you come in and become a vendor. How to become a vendor? Making sure that you come to uh, Bill's office and say that, hey, I'm a local Douglas County vendor. So we've been working at that. And then on the percentage of the minority contractors, I don't know why it didn't come up, <coughs> but I was explaining to that one. I'm not sure why it didn't come up on here. But over that one right now, we're started out being about nine percent when the spots first started. Now we're at thirty-four percent of the spots are going to our minority businesses. And right now it's about nine of the 
29 uh, project, active projects, nine of the 28 active projects are actually going to uh, minority owned firms. <coughs> so that's where we are. Are there any questions? Okay, any questions from the board? Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson? Yeah, I, 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 I'll be pretty quick and Commissioner Mitchell will help clarify this. We were talking about this this morning in our SPLOS briefing, and it, it's this notion of, again, citizens want to know where their dollars are being spent. Um, and, and, and though we do a lot of what I call busy communication, my question is, is it effective? Um, and my question is, and I, I noticed that we have these, sto these pretty storyboards, pretty pictures of, of, of something, community centers, senior centers, et cetera. Uh, but they're housed within this room, which is cabinet members, right? It's, it's, we're talking to ourselves. We've got them down in Citizens Hall, which to um, the citizen that earlier, well, everybody can't be here at 10 o'clock in the morning to see that. But I saw at least one to 200 people coming in there for court that it would have been nice to show them at least where their tax dollars was going. Neither here nor there. Um, some, and some of you know about sometimes you see churches that are being built and you see on the side of the road coming soon. It could be three, four years, but nonetheless, it's a vision. What, what are you... Again, I, I will yield. What are we doing to, to ensure the public um, is notified? Everybody doesn't read this sentinel to get, um, you know, get, get that. Everybody doesn't look at DC 23. Everyone doesn't get Rick Martin's press releases per se. And everybody definitely ain't listening to five hours worth of this to get to the point they want to hear where this stands. But can we get little things like, I mean, what are we doing to help get that message? Sometimes it's just the visual as opposed to I got to read something or listen to something. What are we doing to do that? That's the only question I've got to ensure that where the big dollars are going, people know it's coming. Are you? Well, uh, it's really, I call it uh, threefold. Of course, at any time that there's a town hall meeting, we make sure that we actually put out the information. Whether there are the boards that you guys, different town halls, or there are different events that's going on throughout the county. Because I make sure that I go throughout the county telling people what's coming, especially those projects that are getting ready either <coughs> online this year or will be completed um, within this year. Um, we also make sure that we send out communications. I might have a listing of churches that I end up sending the information out through email. Um, we have social media plugs that go out there. There's uh, one actually on <coughs> Instagram, which is the 2016 spots is on there. So we actually do that part of it. And whenever we run into people, we listen to them. Well, why don't you come out to you know, come out to our neighborhood and speak at one of our um, events. So we end up doing those different setups and making sure that we actually engage them. And then, of course, we still talk to staff and other people just to find out what's the best way of um, doing things, such as uh, out there at, um, I believe it was uh, Deerly. That's one of the areas that we actually had some, some, some of those uh, boards at, you know, for a period of time. So those are the things that we actually do in order to ensure the public that they know what's coming. We're also in the process, actually, TJ from a communication department <coughs> designed signs for all of our SPLOS locations, including the buildings, the uh, intersections. Uh, I think we have some at uh, Lee Road. Um, so we design those in-house. We usually make those in-house, but both the fire and sign machines down. So we have sent out POs to have those signs made. So. <coughs> I'm not sure where we're at in the process. Gary or Scott, don't want to give an answer to that, but the sign should be very close to being completed. So we're, we're progressing then, it sounds like. But you, you hear my note, let's just consider the bigger visual. Um, I wasn't um, challenging or marvelizing the efforts today. I just wanted some things are just simple, right, um, that perhaps we can take advantage of. And I know it's a lot, but I think in this case, we better um, err on the side of over-communicating on how these dollars are being spent than, than assuming that, oh, God, I mean, you just don't want to take the public for granted on when I hear people say that they don't know, they didn't hear. Well, let's try to do as best as we can and let's really assess what we're doing to see, like, okay, is this the best we can do? <coughs> I'm sure Commissioner Mitchell, you got this and you'll, oh, you'll yes. keep us on task. But that was, David, you did great in answering what I wanted. You knew I was coming, I was going to say this, and this was a setup. And I'm sure I did. Okay, thank you so much. Um, anyone else before us? Commissioner Mitchell, I know as part of the chairman of the Parks and Recreation, are you envisioning having signage placed in those key locations, like for example, this senior center have it in that exact spot it's going? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, yes. All right. And, you and, and, I'll, and I'll chime in if you want. I don't yes. know if I could just, and, and, and that's the plan, and we just got to move on it. And I think, Mark, the bigger question is 
how how long do we wait that the machine is down that you spoke about? And oh, we're, we're good to have five okay. days. Okay, right. And that's what my next thing is that let's not wait another month or two we're not. because the machine is down and we're still waiting. Uh, this conversation has been had uh, a, a couple of times too many. Mm -hmm. So we need to kind of either move in another direction until we get the sign. We've already done it. Oh, yeah. And yes, Madam Chair, the, the plan is to kind of place these from yard signs to big signs, the four by fours, the two by fours, and, mm -hmm. and you know, however it works out to make sure we notify them outside of DC 23, outside of uh, emails, because like we know everybody's not on email and everybody is not savvy enough to kind of pick up the, uh, um, the internet. So we, we're kind of going outside the box and, and making sure that this information is out and so these guys can kind of know what we're doing and where their money or their pennies are being spent. So. And I think David and his team have done a great job at where we're going to include Mark, I mean, uh, Rick, not Mark, Rick, mm -hmm. they're doing a great job at moving this stuff along. So outside okay. of that, that's all I got. All right, go ahead. Okay, very good. All right, well, thank you so much, Mr. Good, right. for your presentation, and we'll move on to the next item. Thank you so much. Next, we have a presentation from Ms. Emily Leitner from the Cultural Arts Center. Mm -hmm. It's an update. Uh, we have so many organizations that our Board of Commissioners that operate on our behalf and support our vision. And I've been asking each of uh, um, <coughs> these divisions to come in and just report to give us an important update of what's going on. I would like to say before you say we had a big day on the Taste of Douglasville. That was huge out there. So I know you probably will enlighten the Board of Commissioners as well. So with no further ado, we have Ms. Emily Leitner. She is our uh, Director of the Old Art Center here in Douglasville in Douglas mm. County. Thank you. Good morning, Good morning, Madam Chairman, County Commissioners, and, and everyone here today. As Madam Chair mentioned, my name is Emily Leitner. I am the Executive Director for the Cultural Arts Council here in Douglasville and Douglas County. And 2018 was an outstanding year for us, and it was also very busy. And 2019 is only halfway through the year for us, fiscally, and uh, is already better than ever. And so I want to give you a brief update of where the CAC is and where we're heading um, in that direction. Uh, with Taste of Duxel, which just happened Saturday, uh, we had the largest crown we've ever had. We had the largest vendors we've ever had, and we're looking to grow even more for next year. Thank you, Madam Chair, for passing out the awards. That meant a lot to us, but I know we have uh, Ms. Susan here today as well. It meant a lot to 4-H for uh, presenting those awards as well, and all of everybody who was able to attend. Um, we had a wonderful turnout, and again, all these, uh, the money that we raised through our fundraiser and the Taste of Douglas will go to support the programs that we do throughout the community, which I'll be touching on um, and just shortly. We started a quarterly report card that should come to your commissioner's email um, address to give you a brief update on what we've done in that quarter. Uh, it should show you financials, it should show you how many financials um, come through, and then also how many people we've been able to reach in that quarter as well through visitors, events, programs, our school programs as well. So it gives you a brief snapshot of that quarter, but it also gives you um, things that we have mm -hmm. upcoming, just so uh, you can stay informed with everything that we have going on. We continue to <coughs> offer a wide range of high quality art classes to the citizens of Douglas County, uh, along with our public art, sh uh, our pop-up art shop, which we created in 2017 as an incubator for our local artists to help them get them growing, get them out to the community. Um, and grow their business as well. We are there to help and support them. Uh, along with our nine uh, rotating exhibits that we have, ranging from our Youth Art Month in partnership with the Douglas County School System, but also, uh, like for January and February, we had our Inspiration Loop, which was our Black History Month exhibit. This exhibit alone, from our opening reception, we were able to have 300 people come through just in the opening reception. Then those people also stayed and ate in our downtown restaurants and our county restaurants. And we had people from our surveys and talking with people at the reception came from Alabama, from Tennessee, from all across the state of Georgia. Those people came and stayed in our hotels, all driving economic uh, development in our community just from one exhibit. And we have nine of these exhibits. So that's just one part of something that we're doing to help promote everything that we're doing in the county and for the community. We also just offered a week-long spring break arts camp it's an intensive arts camp. We have four professional teaching artists. Uh, we pull these artists from the Georgia Council of the Arts Registry. Um, they, so they are professionals in their field. We were able to offer four scholarships this year for the camp to the community that we were able to present in the school system. 
And uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and the County Commissioners for your support and assistance with us being able to offer these scholarships. It makes a huge impact, and with the scholarship, we hope to bridge the gap between the opportunity and the arts. Unfortunately, not everybody's able to attend a Spring Break Arts Camp, but with these scholarships, we're able to make an impact on these kids' lives. Uh, we also offer the Douglas County School System a wide variety of innovative arts education programming, including our after-school residencies, our performances, our public art projects, and our family arts centers, again, at no cost to our school system. Thanks to our fundraisers like the Taste of Douglas, so we're able to do all these. We enjoy working with TJ and his crew and participating in the DCTV 23 to help get the word out there to the community along with uh, all of the other wonderful um, aspects that we're able to, to provide to the community. Just a year ago, we instituted uh, our new Cultural Art Council logo before we had a Magnolia. It soldiers well for the past 30 years, but we are stepping into a new generation and we're moving forward. So our new logo represents the Douglas County Community Strategic Plan. We have heard nothing but rave reviews about our new logo, and it's also showing the partnership that we have, not just with our county government and our city government, but also everybody else in between with WSA, with uh, the school system. So we have implemented that logo now, and you'll see it across all of our documents. Um, we have shirts now as well to help get it out there to the community. The CEC also likes to participate and help get the word out to the community about everything the county has to offer, like our High Danger Festival um, that we participate in. And uh, we uh, have a wonderful time. We have a lot of things planned June 1st and 2nd, so please stop by um, if you're in town. We also work with Congressman Scott on his annual scholarship art contest that was in the lobby outside. We uh, have a wonderful time. He's great to work with um, this year. Uh, me and some of my staff were able to judge the competition, and it was a very hard competition. They had some very talented work, and we were uh, blessed to see one of our own Douglas County residents um, be able to win that award as well. And we also help with the scholarship funds that he presents um, to those students as well. And uh, September Saturdays and many other events that the county has, we love to participate, help get the word out that everything we and the county have to offer. I recently presented in March uh, the State of the Arts Address for Douglasville and Douglas County at the Arts, Culture, and Humanities Month. And thank you, Tiffany, for helping pull all of that together. It was a fabulous event. If you were not able to attend, uh, we had a well, uh, a wide variety of uh, arts being represented. And one thing that always amazes me, the libraries. The libraries have so much going on and finding ways to help get it out there more. And so we're trying to partner with our libraries, with other communities that are, are presenting arts and, and get that out there because that's our job as the Cultural Arts Council. It's not just focus on what we're doing, but what our community is doing and getting it out there to the public. We also finalized our strategic plan this time last year. And one of the events that came out of it was our Cheers to the Arts event. Uh, we realized that we are not reaching as many millennials right now. So we want to target more millennials to get them in and involved in the Arts Council and in our community. And so we created this Cheers to the Arts through a survey that we did. And we did four series back to back. One of them was called Wine in the Woods at the Dog River Library. And it was a huge success. Our valuations and surveys asked for the, us to repeat it. So now we're going to be doing it again, but only <coughs> quarterly now. And through that survey also, we realized that a good portion of those people who came to the Dog River Library had either never been there or they have never heard of it. And so it was a great opportunity to promote the Dog River Library and all the wonderful aspects that it has within our own community, all while supporting the arts at the same time. Another thing that came out of our strategic plan was our public art initiative. Many of you have already seen some of the works coming around in the community. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have anything really big yet in our community. So this is something that the Cultural Art Council is striving to bring more to Douglasville and Douglas County to make us known for the public art. You'll see it when you go to uh, all the way from California to New York, if you go to the beach, you see the light fixtures painted. Uh, so we've uh, implemented a few projects and we have a whole lot more underway. Just a few is our fire hydrant. Uh, it's called Fire Up the Arts in partnership with the Douglas County Fire Department, the Douglas County School System, and of course WSA. So you'll see those along the streets right now. Our first stint is from the Cultural Arts Center to O'Neill Plaza. We have a lot more coming underway, so stay tuned for those. But also we have um, our first bench was our first public art initiative 
that we uh, presented to the community at our um, unveiling of our new logo, which now resides outside of the Culture Arts Center. It was inspired by our butterfly garden, uh, which is maintained by the Master Gardeners and the Anaconastic Garden Club. Uh, they do a fabulous job, and so that bench says love one another with hydrangeas um, and, and butterflies on it. And uh, talking with other people, because I would love to see these in all of our butterfly gardens. Let's, let's try to make it happen. I wrote a grant. And I was able to get some money, so now we are working on getting benches throughout all of our butterfly gardens for everything they're doing. We have two. Um, we had RFPs put out. Two are already underway. One is at Dealey Park, and the other one will be at Douglas County Library. Our goal is to get them in before Hydrangea Festival. Um, and then another one of our projects is our bathrooms called Be the Change. I partner with the Douglas County School System. And our first trial uh, is at the North Douglas Elementary School, and it's words of affirmation. And a time where bullying is such an issue, where does it happen the most? It happens in the bathroom. There's no teachers. There's no cameras. And so if they see be kind or you are beautiful, maybe we can make that small impact from these uh, murals that we'll be doing. So stay tuned. That will be, um, be happening during the summer. The sketches have already been approved, so we're moving forward with that now. Um, but also our Art on Loan program is a part of our public art initiative. We've currently uh, been expanding that. Uh, we are thriving at WSA, the Douglas County Economic Development Authority. We have recently expanded to the Capitol, thanks to my, uh, Senator Mike Dugan. We've changed out some artworks with uh, some of our commissioner's office, but we also expanded to the new annex building um, and added things into the lobbies and then uh, throughout their offices. Again, making art available to everyone. And so we are fortunate to be able to do that. We have officially gone uh, rotated through all of our permanent collection now. And we are now uh, working with our local artists to get it out there. And WSA is a great example. We've sold six pieces. We don't keep any of the profits. We give it straight to the artist. <coughs> so now we are not only getting the artist's name out to the community, but we're also uh, supporting and driving the economic growth for him, himself, and our local artists in our local community. Um, so those are just a few things. We also had our Mad Hatter Tea Party in uh, March. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Carthan, for judging our bonnet contest. We had a uh, completely sold out event, and you know we always publicize this for younger kids, and we have a great time with uh, an egg hunt. We have a hat contest, um, but I've noticed there's a lot more adults getting into it now as well, which is fun to see people come out in their costumes. We have the characters from Wonderland attend. Um, so it's a great event for the community um, to, to come out, and again, uh, that's just something that we do. It's not a fundraiser for us, but another activity for the kids and the, and the adults to uh, participate in as well. Uh, lastly, we have our annual meeting. Our fiscal year ends the end of June. Our annual meeting is June 11th. Chairman and County Commissioners will be receiving your invitation today. I've dropped them off. Um, I encourage you to attend. As we wrap up our fiscal year, you'll get the numbers on how we did for the year. We'll talk about our visitors, our financial situation. Um, and this is our fifth year in the black, so we are growing um, exponentially, and we are reaching more people than we ever have before. Um, so you'll be able to see um, how we're doing, what we have coming up planned for the next year. And we will also uh, have some demos, some activities, because what's a meeting without getting your hands in some paint? So we will have great food uh, catered by Taco Mac as well. Uh, I'm currently working with ARC, the Atlanta, Atlanta Regional Commission, and ALMA, which is the Arts <coughs> Leaders of Metro Atlanta, to expand on the public art initiative. I'm sitting on their board now to promote all of the artwork in Metro Atlanta, but especially Douglas County. So we have a lot of things underway, a lot of new things coming, and I want to personally thank you for your continued support and citizens of Douglas County. Uh, for all of our current programs and our new initiatives as well. Your support means the world to us and we couldn't do it without you. As you already know, the arts can bring people together across all boundaries. It can drive our economy. It can unify a community. Art and artists are only in music, museums or concert halls. They are all around us. It's just a matter of how you interpret it. Every one of us has the ability to create and to imagine a way to make our community healthier and stronger. By working together, we can bring those impossible dreams to life. Thank you, Chairman and County Commissioners, for your time. And let me speak with you today. Do you all have any questions for me? Okay. Any questions or comments from the Board of Commissioners? 
just like to personally thank you for providing this wealth of uh, knowledge to all of us and, and this information that you have brought forth. It is certainly enlightening the Board of Commissioners and also our citizens of Douglas County. We have a lot of things going on, positive things, yes. and uh, thank you for raising a, a positive profile here in Douglas County. And I'm telling you, we just go. We don't have anywhere else to go but up. That's right. So thank you for all the things that you're doing. I know you we have some surprises a little later for the we Board of Commissioners, <laughs> but we'll tell them a little later. So all right. thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Board of Commissioners, we'll move on to tab number five, and I'm just going to mention it briefly. I'm not sure if uh, uh, a resolution in support of the Census 2020 and to form a local complete county committee. Uh, Ron Roberts, if you could just give us a this brief uh, description of what this resolution will be about tomorrow. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Good morning, um, and I will be very brief. The, the resolution is in support of the Census 2020, and it recognizes that we had our, our, our Census 2020 kickoff event last week, and that we are forming a complete count committee to, to tackle and count all the citizens in Douglas County. Let's count. All right, let's count. <laughs> Any questions from board? Just would like to commend you last week for such a stellar kickoff. Uh, it was great, and we look forward to counting everyone. Like you just said, let's count. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, next, we have tab number <coughs> six, authorization to approve a revised intergovernmental agreement with the city of Douglasville to install a northbound right lane on Highway 5 at Douglas Boulevard and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final review. County Administrator, do you have any comment on this? Uh, yes, ma'am. The, the agreement's essentially the same agreement we approved last time. Uh, it's up to, it's either half or up to $600,000 if the city will contribute to this project. Um, but after the board approved it last time, the copy we received back from the city had a deadline in it. Ours did not. So we talked with the city, the deadline they had included in their agreement was not attainable. Um, so we said that they negotiated a new deadline as far as the project goes. Um, so what's included in the agreement, I'm not, not saying it'll take this long to do the project, um, but there is a lot of work. You got all the, you got right away, you got utilities that have to be relocated. Um, those will take a while. But uh, so the date was included in here is July 1st, 2022. Okay. Any questions for the board? Just hope okay. that they didn't take that long. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That, it's just a buffer, like county yes, administrator date. Okay. All right. Thank you. We'll move on to tab number seven, which is the, our first business item, and it's authorization to approve $450,000 for additional services for the Douglas County Community Service Board and amend the budget. Um, Mr. Lightfoot, Ray Lightfoot, and there we are. Um, Board of Commissioners, uh, Mr. Lightfoot presented it. Uh, he presented to us uh, at our last meeting. Didn't know if you all had additional questions or concerns about this <coughs> item or comments. Commissioner Geiger? I would just say that I went over there and uh, toured the SBC. And uh, I was very impressed, and I've met some of the staff and the uh, uh, what they do for different parts of the. Uh, it's not just mental health, and it's not just uh, drug addiction. It's just not just one thing. It's, it covers a wide range of services. Uh, my only problem at at the beginning was we were surprised with it. <laughs> uh, it's just like uh, a judge being surprised uh, uh, I mean, making a decision on something he doesn't hasn't heard the facts on and that's what we needed uh, and perhaps we can avoid things like this in uh, the future where we will each uh, commissioner will have a sit down time with uh, people that are bringing forth a hundred four hundred and fifty thousand dollar amendment to the budget because we just we, we have to find it you know? and maybe we can do better in our budget process where if we anticipate something of this magnitude that it can be included in the budget somewhere you know as a contingency or something but uh, I was very impressed with the operation over there and the people that you have on staff and thank your you so services much. Yeah. thank you so much Commissioner Gatt. Oh, thank you so much, Commissioner Gardner. Uh, Commissioner Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, I'd be great. 
Um, again, um, no, no, you did a great job in our last presentation. Your last presentation, if I hadn't said it, was very, very thorough. Um, you know, for, for the citizens, and just um, <coughs> this is something that's being driven by the Community Service Board, uh, which is um, like our development authority, like anything else that is one step removed from us. It has its own board of directors, in which um, I believe Madam Chair is a member of it. Um, I, I've been aware of this project going on. Uh, I've been aware of um, uh, its status, its need in the community, but also the need to fund it. Um, in other words, we've grown since we really originally established the original allocation for this, right? Our density has, I mean, the density of this population has really grown. And so watching this, we did do a study um, during last year's budget process. I did have this on my tab as uh, an appropriation during the budget process. $150,000 was acknowledged, right? It was a priority, but it was like, okay, let's pause on this, let's, let's massage this, let's see how the year plays out. It's not, nothing new. Now, as I've always said, commissioners tend to focus on what they think is a priority. And that's okay. I don't look at everything, I just look at the things that I advocate for and I, I tend to keep up with them. But I want to make sure the public recognizes that this is very, very needed. This administration is committed to health care and making sure that it's advanced, uh, making sure that there's proper funding. And so that means there's, there's going to be a shift, again, in policy toward like, okay, we're going to spend enough money over there on that thing. What about this? And so I do acknowledge that this bogey of roughly about what, half million dollars um, is big. Let's acknowledge, um, for the record, $50,000 that this Board of Commissioners has um, approved in times past for mental health. Um, our, our, the prior agency that we had allocated it to for the past two years didn't step up this year. So 50000 was put over in that budget, obviously by default. Ray, my question is, are you still going to handle the mental health that we committed to? Um, absolutely. Um, just to, to caveat on that point, yes. um, last week we had talked with DBHDD, yes. um, and we received additional funding, <clears throat> and I believe the total, if I'm not mistaken, is around 531000 to extend intensive case management and supportive mental health services for, um, uh, excuse me, supportive employment services. And then uh, last Thursday, myself <clears throat> and Judge McLean met, and we had finalized um, the plan to provide the treatment as well as the shelter for the sanctu Sanctuary Village program. Um, so we're going to become a glass so. so So there's, so what we're doing is basically stopping the bleeding, right? We're saying we're committing to this for five years. And my question to you last time, which is, okay, at what point will it become a little bit more self-sufficient? Do we think we can get there through these additional services that you just mentioned? Because I think that's important. While I'm, I'm, I'm solely committed, I'm also challenging to be efficient with your services, and what, what is it going to take? More people, more money, or what? So just make it brief, and we can get out of this. Okay, well, two parts. First part was, it will take more contracted services, which we're negotiating with the Department of Behavioral Health and Development Disabilities now, which I just alluded to. The second part will, it will take the bodies, it will take that, that competent staff, which I have here representing us this afternoon, um, that will start to make that mission happen. Um, and then lastly, it will take that community buy-in, which I think is evident uh, from what we saw this morning. So what we're looking at overall is probably a two to three year uh, process before we're self-sufficient due to um, us having to build that FIFA service type of model. But yes, I, I see us in the near future being self-sustaining. And, and then my final question is, so what I'm hearing is that this is, is this still Cobb Douglas Community Service Board or do we have sort of the, the, the autonomy or at least semi-autonomy to be in control of our own destiny versus being dumped in our own hand. Can you speak to that? This is Douglas County's Community Services Board only, um, with some oversight and governance from the state of Georgia. Okay. Let me show you. Okay. Any other comments? Yeah. Commissioner Carpenter. Uh, Mr. Lightford, thank you again for your presentation. It was wonderful. Um, I did have some constituents <coughs> that emailed me in regards to wanting to know if the money that um, you did or did not receive was ill spent. Can you just talk about that to let them know again that, you know, the break is what caused the, the, the shortfall? Oh, absolutely. So right now our total budget for the fiscal year is probably around about $3.2 million. Of that, about $1.6 million uh, comes directly from HUD in support of our residential programs, the 88 apartments I alluded to in our briefing and our eight homes. 
and that goes back to pay for rents and utilities for those individuals there. And that's just reimbursement. Basically, we pay it out, they pay us back. Um, does not include the treatment staff, which is probably around another 300 and some odd with thousand um, in uh, expenses to us. Um, as it pertains to the mental health court, right now our maximum reimbursement is $183,000. Uh, right now my core mental health staff for the outpatient is about $1.2 million in cost. Um, so to answer the question, there is no additional revenues to be um, fraudulently uh, spent or wasteful. Uh, what we've done is we've tapped into our reserves and been able to continue those services without inter interruption to the uh, community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Question from yeah, Ms. Yeah, yeah, I'll be very quick. It, we, we're talking about just providing for it, and I appreciate um, the, the comment about the budget and stuff. So please recognize, let's talk about the source of funding. Where does it come from? Um, the Board of Commissioners initiated a TAN earlier this year. Um, it's 16, it was an $18 million TAN, $16 million was for cash flow needs. There was an additional $2 million that was set aside that allowed us to do things that were unanticipated, unplanned. That was the whole point. But we didn't anticipate or plan that we'd be in a hole with this. And uh, part of our public comments, in which I think the uh, county clerk can confirm, we stated that the overage, the $2 million could be used for perhaps four things, community service board, technology website update, um, um, DOT contributions for matches if necessary, and pension um, obligations if in fact it came down. Madam Chair, I just want to state that for the record that that is the source, because sometimes people, I, I didn't hear it said, but if we need to have something to come out of our finance committee um, as a formal recommendation, we can do that because we got a meeting at 2 o'clock. That is on the plate of the board. You okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. We have time and and thanks. Vice Chair Robinson for making that statement because I would love to hear that come from uh, the uh, Finance Committee. So I would assume when you guys are in your meeting, that would be the first step in the right direction. My other question to you though, so we mentioned that um, you talked to, and I, we've had a couple of conversations that you want to kind of share with the general public. Uh, you've had a conversation with CORE, you've had a conversation with Judge Bob McClain and a few others <coughs> to, to, to re-understand that this here is going to be a, a help in so many words to all the various pots of money that's being spent <coughs> that's going toward mental health, that we wanna make sure that we all capitalize and kind of understand that each individual have their pot of monies in which they're dealing with. How do we kind of bring it all together to make it one? Um, well, to, I guess to, to answer that question, if, number one, we'll start off with just having to build the trust and sitting down and really looking at what are the common objectives for all the programs. Right which is a, a more sound mental health um, system in Douglas County. Um, also, we'd have to start looking at how do we share information, because that's one of the things that's solid. Um, individual comes in there in my electronic medical record system, and the judge's uh, medical record system, and left and right hand are talking and communicating. So the second thing is, is that we would have to come together in principle of how we're gonna conduct business to make sure that there were no breaks or gaps in coverage based on uh, historical numbers. Um, and then lastly, what we'd have to do is that we would have to have buy-in and input from each partner mm -hmm. to ensure that the revenues are being used the right way to seat all of the interests of everyone that's at the table. Correct, correct. And speaking of numbers, because numbers is what the state is looking for. So I'm assuming that each one of these, these numbers games that we're having to play with the state will be a part of the state numbers for this operation to kind of uh, look forward to possible state and any other funding or you know, grants and all that kind of good stuff. Right? Oh. Uh, absolutely. Um, first part of that would be that you all would get, and the community would get a true number of who are we servicing with mental health issues, developmental disability, disability issues in the community, mm -hmm. um, because it's consolidated effort now. So mm -hmm. we won't say that we've had a thousand that are incarcerated, 1,700 are being serviced in the CSB, and then we have another 400 on the docket for, for court cases. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to bring all that stuff together. So you get to use all those numbers? Correct. Okay. Okay. And that's so, what I'm alluding to. I want to make sure that, oh, that, that the big picture is the numbers that you'll use, not Judge McClain's number and, and core numbers that they submit probably separately. I don't know how that help or work with everybody, but I'm, I have to just assume that you are having those kind of conversations so everybody can feel like they're part of the growth and the direction when it comes to mental health. Uh, absolutely. And like I said, it's an our citizens approach. And what that would do is be sent up to the Department of Behavioral Health which they would all set our funding based on the, the service that were going up. The census would uh, ultimately increase uh, based on all of us talking together and communicating. So. 
And last but not least, share with the general public that this marriage that we all thought we had, <laughs> that I'm assuming it was common law or none of the above, you know, <laughs> had no paper, but I, it, it shocked me. Right even when you came and explained to us where we are, but I'm glad that at least we're taking a hard look at how this and how we move forward. Uh, absolutely, so in July of 1994, uh, the two boards, both Cobbs uh, CSB and Douglas CSB decided that they would share a chief executive officer that would be appointed to serve over both. Um, that was kind of taken because at the same time we knew, we knew the merger of public health had taken place. So it was just, a, I guess, a, a, a a known unknown that we were one entity. Um, during the investigation though, however, um, and some auditing, we found out that we were never together. Um, two separate contracts with the state, the whole nine. Um, different accountability practices, everything. But the issue was, is that the state had viewed us as one, and so they were shifting funding to be more predominantly placed into the Cobb contract and us to be considered a pastor. And so what happens over time is now we, we realize the need for mental health and uh, development disabilities treatment here in this county has grown, mm -hmm. but we have no meat in our contract. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that is is certain things that are inherent in contracts. You have maximum reimbursement limits that are set based on your service population. You have guaranteed revenues that are set aside for your benefits plan of your staff. All of those uh, things were removed out of the Douglas contract. And so what we had was a shell mm -hmm. of a CSB contract compared to other community services boards, servicing counties of our similar size. Right. So, so what brought this on? What, what brought up the divorce? I mean, um, well, we, we got an active board who came in and realized that the total CSB footprint uh, for Douglas County at the time that they walked in was about 40 employees mm -hmm. uh, in dilapidated buildings with black mold up the wall. Um, there was no kind of uh, connection with any of the other services that were taking place within the community. Um, so absenteeism is basically what, what made this change. We got a board in that said um, that we deserve better, we need better, and they started making the moves to appoint the right people in the right positions to start making effective change. And did I make Cobb come back around and say, well, wait a minute, if you guys want all these types of services in dollars and cents, because probably it's about dollars and cents. They decided to say, well, no, we're, we're not really married. We're just, uh, we're just, we're dating, I guess. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> well, I wouldn't place, easy, but, <laughs> right, but I wouldn't place it on the entire Cobb board, okay. but we did have a chief executive officer, officer that felt that way, who um, asked to have his contract amended to be, to for all uh, references to deficits be pulled out of. Got it. And, and last but not least, we have a, Mark, this may be a question for you though, I think $173,000 at that annually that we deal with, or would that be Michelle or somebody can kind of share with the general public? Yeah, it's $173,000 that's right. currently in the budget. Right, that we normally deal with. Mm -hmm. This is in addition to the opportunity to kind of get everything back in line to kind of move this particular program forward, correct? Correct. Um, right now that $173,000 is used to offset cost of psychiatry. Mm -hmm. um, right now, with the 40% benefits markup, it costs me roughly for a 36 hour, hour a week psychiatrist around $183,000. <coughs> um, and so, maximum reimbursement being $183,000 as well, that's, that's two psychiatrists, but it doesn't cover any of the clinical staff that come along with that, uh, the nursing staff that comes along with that, or the actual um, group leaders. Right. And so, that's kind of how that, that, that budget is lined out right now, that $173,000. So this number we're talking about, 450, will just only get you through the year, or it's, that's going to be an annual thing that's going to be needed. But at the same token, it'll get you back in line to where you can ask for state dollars because you'll now have concrete numbers that you can kind of send back to the state, stating what we're doing, what, what we're doing as a county, and how we're really taking a hard look at mental health. Uh, correct. So what happened with the state is um, we told them we wanted to be able to stand on our own two feet. They said, prove it. Let's see the community buy-in and what you're going to be able to do first. And then we'll start appropriating our funds accordingly to what we think you can and, and, and we'll be able to do. Uh, one of the things we had to do, we had to hire a complete administrative uh, staff because we had been dependent on Cobb's administration. Right. Um, you know, clinical director positions, um, accounting positions, all of these things. Um, while also trying to expand and grow the actual service uh, arena. And so what we've done um, this year is we've taken uh, the revenues that we've saved in different ways and started pushing it towards staff growth. Mm -hmm. Now what we're doing in return is we're going back to the state saying this is what we built. Mm -hmm. Now how are you going to support us now? I need an increased maximum reimbursement for outpatient services. I need additional services that we once relied on COB that we can now generate and run here in our local community. Mm -hmm. And so it's, so it's basically a twofold. 
So we are asking for that 450 for sustainability, but also for growth. Okay, and last but not least, can you provide an organizational chart of how this will be all made up, count, so we can account for everybody and where they are, with what it looks like, so um, that, that, that vision for me will look better on paper if I can kind of get an idea of what that truly will look like, so. Absolutely, I, I can't support that. Um, I will tell you just in the last two months that we've grown our outpatient staff from eight to 21. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is 21 direct care providers. We are talking clinicians, we are talking um, therapists, we are talking group leaders, we're talking the, the whole gamut, substance abuse counselors, um, uh, direct service support staff for our development of disabilities. So it's all, I can, I can support you with that document to show you what it looks like. Got it. How, how long would it take you to kind of pull something off? I'm assuming uh, it's, it's being built now, so I can give it to you by the end of the day. I can actually send it for you. So it's not a problem. And I think that this team would like to probably see that as well. So outside of that, I mean, I, I just I think it's, it's, it's commendable of what you're trying to help, what we're trying to help you pull off, because it only makes sense. I mean, we can't, I, I know the state has kind of did their cuts and don't want to <clears> spend that much more money on mental health, but I, I don't think we as a county can under, we, we, we can't do that. I mean, it, it only makes sense because I don't, I can see now the sheriff and his operation trying to house these individuals. That's not the place for them. They, they, they've got a sickness that we need to kind of address. And, and, you know, at our Taj Mahal jail, it's not the place to try to address it, so. Absolutely. Okay, I yield back. Okay, thank Thanks. you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. Okay, well, thank you so much, Mr. Michael. Um, yeah. Change your presentation. Okay, Mr. Wilson, you have, um, yes. Mr. Wilson is the, is the Vice Chairman of the CS Board. Um, State your name for the record. Yeah. Wilson, Thank you. Please. Ron Wilson, Vice Chair, CSP. <clears throat> As you heard, one of the things we're trying to do is establish a relationship and a partnership with many of the organizations within the community. And one of those important partners is the uh, court system. So, uh, Judge McLean, if you'd like to say a word or two. <coughs> no. I'm here just to support what Ray is asking for. Okay, good. And we thank you for being here. That's important because uh, the court system will be a major part of our effort this year. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Wilson. We appreciate you coming in as well. And thank you so much, uh, Judge McClain, for your to support this effort for CSB. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Mr. Lightfoot. All right, we'll move on to tab number eight. Tab number eight is authorization to approve a sewer easement and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Worthington. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, as, it, as it said, this is an easement for a sewer line uh, to cross a vacant piece of property that Douglas County owns at the uh, corner of Douglas Hill Road and Thornton Road. And that's the future home of fire station number nine. Um, the sewer easement's required by a developer, a neighboring development. Uh, currently, the sewer is across the street and, and down the road a little ways, and they need to cross over about 200 feet of the county property. It's in the front of the property. Um, by allowing this, if y'all so choose to do so, uh, it will give the county access to sewer when we develop a fire station, immediate access. The, the sewer line will be it'll all save the, money. It will save us a lot of money. Y'all may remember the... Uh, the trials and tribulations of tying the animal shelter on the sewer that was across and down the road a little way. So this will eliminate all of that. So uh, the developer that's putting it in has agreed to um, put clean outs at both the manholes and taps so it'll be easy access for us to tie into either one. I don't see that there's any, any negative impact on development. There's so, uh, substantially deep enough not to impact anything. So. Okay, I will call this. Precondition yes. to be prepared in advance. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? All right, thank you so much for your presentation. Tab number nine, authorization to approve the purchase of a replacement audio equipment in juvenile court two for the sum of $19,905.95 to be uh, funded through the permit uh, account 190. Is Mark Price here? Oh, there you are. Would you please, you want to go to the podium if you would? Can you tell me a little bit about this uh, replacement of the audio equipment in juvenile court? Uh, <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, courthouse was built in 1997. We had state-of-the-art audio equipment installed in all the courtrooms, and uh, 
2019 is no longer state of the art. The <laughs> digital age has taken over. I've spent several thousand dollars over the course of the last several years repairing uh, courtroom audio systems as they break down. And every time the technician comes out, they tell me that we need to we need to upgrade. They're, they're getting harder to find the parts for the system. Mm -hmm. And the technicians are <coughs> younger technicians and they're not trained to work on the old systems. Judge Walker's uh, juvenile courtroom too is currently um, not working. And she's working with a borrowed PA system from TJ, our communications department. So what I'd like to do is, uh, I've had a contractor look at it and they said that they can do it for a not to exceed uh, $20,000, under $20,000. And this will give us the prototype. I think we can see what, there's a lot of unknowns when they replace it. The equipment is set. We know what we're going to get, but there's a lot of unknowns in the labor. And if we could get this done, then we'll know what it's going to take to do the other courtrooms and maybe budget them going forward for, for future years. But right now, um, we do need to get that courtroom back online. Okay. Any questions from the board, Vice Chairman Robinson? Yeah, I mean, and again, it, this is a broader context of, you know, we're re re redoing this courthouse right now. We're doing a lot of renovations, and this is one of the things where when it comes to long term capital planning, you know, we have to anticipate these things, right? Uh, I would have liked to have known that, that this was the need when we're sitting here setting aside the money for it, you know, moving the tax commissioner out to another building and what it took for this. But 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 duly noted, it needs to be done. But but let's be thoughtful. So this twenty thousand is just for the juvenile courtroom two. Yep, courtroom two. Um, I, when I think about citizens hall and it's it's inadequate in my mind. Um, audio system, when I think about everything else, can we get our minds around what it takes to upgrade? Because this thing is old. It's aged. And so, um, duly noted on the need to do right now, right? But can we at least extend forward to say, okay, guys, when y'all come, you know, when y'all come to us, come stay. <coughs> I know sometimes we're like, well, let's just do this one. And you already know that there's a broader need. And we just stage it. It's like, well, I only can spend so much right now. But I, I would just like to know the context of what we're getting into. Um, but but that, that's my question to the county administrator. Is there any other courtroom that needs to be upgraded? Is there anything else, um, you know, Citizens Hall that needs to be upgraded um, versus the Peace Bill? That would be helpful. But Madam Chair, I'm not suggesting that we stop the need today. Um, Judge Walker needs to have that courtroom in order, and I have no problem. I'm just saying I at like, least like to know the full dollar amount of how so, the upgrade. Yeah, so we rely we we rely on other departments to tell us and Mark what what their needs are. Yep. Um, so Judge Emerson had sent an email out earlier. So they are looking at what it would take to um, to replace the sound systems in the other courtrooms as well. Gotcha. Um, but this was not submitted to us as a BIR, to my knowledge. And I'm going by memory in the uh, twenty for this budget. So mm -hmm. it wasn't submitted last year. Right. So I, well, but at least they didn't realize it was going to go out. So to, to that point, and the source of funding for this is what? There wasn't any contingency. The balance in there is 420000 And this was on the, uh, the five-year um, capital improvement plan yep. that we did last year. This was number one on the list for 2020. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got worked out continuously as this was. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Price. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to tab number 10, authorization to approve the contract for Everly Ford as senior chaplain as a newly created position at the Douglas County Sheriff's Office and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Pretty self-explanatory on that one. Um, yeah. I understand this has been in the works for a little while now um, to add Edwin to the uh, as our chaplain for the sheriff's office. <coughs> the sheriff's office. Okay. I think the board previously approved this. Mm -hmm. We had but it was not a contract for the yes. sheriff's office. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we all, I do remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Commissioner Geiger, I know you have yeah. a question. Yes, Bobby. Uh, was was this to replace the minus? No, um, my understanding is Edwin is the chaplain for the overall sheriff's office. His, his, uh, so Gary was focused on the jail and the ministries inside the jail. Edwin will be over the department, that my understanding. With, um, what we've got in the past, I believe, was uh, some uh, 
volunteer chaplain services, uh -huh. but Edwin will be the department official chaplain. Okay, but CJ still does the other ministry, uh, ministry there? The ministry, that stuff's uh -huh. still going on in the jail, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. that, that never stopped since McManus has been gone. I don't, I'm not sure exactly who is the one in charge of that. That and kind of works. CJ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, all right, I get that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Commissioner Carthen? Just curious, is this coming out of the sheriff's budget or our issue? Mark, the sheriff's budget. Yeah. All right. That was it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll move on to the next item, tab number 11, authorization to extend the ground lease agreement for sheltering arms <coughs> for an additional five year period and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Madam Chair. Bernard. Madam Chair, this uh, is a sheltering arms agreement that was. Uh, done back in 1999 and it was a long-term lease that's expiring at the end of June 30th of this year. In the deal that was started in 1999, they had a number of option periods to extend for five years and so this <coughs> is an extension exercising one of those options for an additional period of five years but they'll have others under the original agreement theoretically. This is for the property at 3833 Longview Drive. The tenant pays $10 a month, but pays all utilities. And again, it's the, the ground lease was signed with Sheltering Arms, a nonprofit, in 1999. Um, very long agreement as far as length of time, and um, I'm not, we're just bringing it to you. They do have the right to exercise the option. I think at some point somebody might want to renegotiate how long that's going to be and what that's going to be like. You know, we were not involved in the original 1999 deal. Okay. And uh, how long did we announce how long, how much it Well, this initial time. extension, I think, is for five years. So another five years. If you read the agreement, the agreement contemplates 10 <coughs> option periods of five years, 50 years, which seems excessive to me at the time, but that's what's in the original agreement. Okay. Any questions from the board about Sherman Lawson? Yeah, it's really interesting. We have, we have these, these latent precedents that are set, right, for, for long periods of time, and we, 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 we do what we do. And so, all right, duly noted. Um, Shelton Arms, so that's the one right there uh, um, behind <coughs> Bear Road, one street over. Where's the long view? Does anybody know? That's the old bowling alley, I believe. The old bowling alley, all right, all right. I know we talk about skating, all that stuff. And yeah, that was from 1999, all right. So my oldest was born in 97. Um, my youngest born in 2000, they both went there um, during that time period uh, when they were infants and, and grew up. And I think um, at that time, um, um, uh, Councilman um, Sean Bergami uh, was the center manager there. And so that predates all of our elected lives. I, I know the area quite well. Um, and I, um, I recognize what we're trying to do here, but it, it gives context. And I, I have no objections to um, supporting this matter. Right. All right. Okay. Any other questions regarding this one? All right. Thank you. We'll move on to the next tab. Tab number 12, authorization to award the painting of the Woody Fight Center to USA Painting <coughs> for the total cost of $17,980 and amend the budget. Uh, Director Peacock? Is it? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is being brought to you today because it was a non-budgeted budgeted item in the uh, 2019 budget. Um, it's something that's needed. <coughs> the painting is needed, and we're just uh, asking the, co the commission to allow us to amend the budget and have the painting done. Okay. Um, County Administrator, you want to expand yes, a little more on this one? Yeah, the chairman had, had brought this up. Um, and the plan was, even though it would come out of the fund balance, the plan was to use the $60,000 that was uh, budgeted as well that we received from the, uh, the easement on Earl D. Lee Boulevard. Okay. And uh, so the board would be more familiar with this. Uh, the the uh, Woody Fife Center has not been painted in 15 years, so they, and also the carpet hadn't been changed as well <coughs> in 15 years. So if you go over there and just round with me as well. I've looked and I go over monthly for my birthday parties. And it's not deplorable, but it's right up on, on deplorable. So uh, we had the extra funding that was the easement for, was the easement for right, where, where's the easement located? For the, 
Burger King that's next door to the, the park where the sign is on Earl D. Lee Boulevard for the, the sign for the sheriff's park. Yeah, so we want to do some of that funding for that instead of putting it in the general fund and putting it up because we good in the general fund and also got another, we're looking at the, the senior center on Fairburn Road. We put some new mini blinds in that area and then also there's a couple of rooms that need painting. Mark, is that correct? Just like yeah, we're, 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 we're working on those places. Yeah, those two senior centers have had not had anything done, particularly a uh, wooden fight in 15 years. So anyway, Commissioner. <coughs> so I just have a question. Director Peacock, I see that there were three quotes. Um, substantially between the first and second, there's a big difference. Can you explain why you went with the second one as opposed to the first one? Uh, the experience of the contractor. <coughs> the experience. So had Howell's painting not ever painted? I honestly was not. I honestly was not involved in this, so I really don't have the I'll information. I'll talk to Sharon about the low quote. So the low quote was a single person said it would take four months to complete. Um, okay. <laughs> well, so, yeah. So that. Yeah. <laughs> Decisions we make should, are, should just be definitive. When I think about our seniors who paid into the system, they're on the back side of life. I, I don't have that um, status yet. But, but, but I respect what they've contributed. We shouldn't have to reason or rationalize the provision of basic, basic quality of life. Change the carpet. Paint the walls. I mean, again, it's about priorities. Like, God, we spent... <coughs> Hundred twenty million dollars make eight hundred people comfortable, but yet we rationalize why we should spend sixty thousand dollars to make all of our seniors have a quality experience coming in. Now I couldn't tell you the carpet is dirty. I'm trusting the madam chair tells me it's dirty. It's dirty. I get it. The walls are are messed up. And so sometimes, I mean, I think we're we're at a point now in, in this board. I'm, I'm very pleased to see we need to do what's right because it's right. Um, and I hear a lot of conversation about the spend, but the spend is the taxpayer dollars, and it should be reallocated to where the need is. And people shouldn't have to sort of, you know, uh, you know, eggshell ask for money or ask for support. The city shouldn't have to go through that. They should have advocacy. <coughs> and so for that, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to stand behind this request. I, I recognize it's unplanned and unbudgeted, but some things it's just, you just didn't know about it. And, and when you realize and you focused on it, it's like, okay, that's a, that's a no-brainer. Uh, in comparison to some of the other spends. <coughs> but for this one, um, the seniors, Madam Chair, they just deserve what they deserve. So I have no problem. I do. Madam Chair, it was, it was included in the budget. It was a request. It was it scheduled for the March week, <coughs> which didn't pan out like we thought it would. Um, and then Madam Chair came up with the idea to use uh, the funds from the $60,000 on the uh, on the evening. Yeah, so it wasn't put to make it happen. Yeah, okay, it didn't make it. I, I, I get it didn't make it, but okay, I'm going to come back. It didn't make it. Now, don't, don't make me go down the path of, of what did make the budget and what gets squeezed out. But we had contingency. So just because the easement popped up as, oh, we can use that black <coughs> Why don't you just use, I mean, using the, the, look how we're spending money. We'll spend money on court stuff and jail stuff out of contingency for that, that sound system. But for the seniors, we had to rationalize, okay, we might happen to hit the lot of something came in an extra. I disagree. My point is, if you want to do it for the seniors, they should be off the top. And everything else falls to the bottom if you can get our internal. That's my only point. It's like, look at how the decisions are being made. You got contingency. You got half a million dollars. So why, why, why did we have to wait for the seat? Oh, we just happen to have that. Like, oh, it should come out the same pot and be the same priority because you have control over it. It shouldn't be reasoned. One more time, the seniors deserve better than that. And we, 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 we sort of dangle this, like, well, we'll see if we can get to you. We'll see it. But then we're spending money on all these other things that are internal, and I challenge that psyche. And I'm, I'm, I'm challenging to make you aware, like, look at your decisions. Like, the seniors just deserve better. They should be off the top, and everybody else should figure out whether or not if they still make the budget. Stuff like health care should be off the top. Seniors should be off the top. 
The rest of this stuff should, it should be on our tabs to see if it made the budget. It shouldn't be squeezed in, but that's just me. Again, I have no problem. We, we took the long route to get to the same place we intended to get to, but um, I support this 100%. Again, that's your idea. We're good. Okay. Well, we'll move on to tab number. <coughs> Thank you so much. You're already seated. Uh, we'll move to tab number 13, authorization to approve the implementation of a community garden agreement by the UGA Co uh, Cooperative Extension Department of Douglas County. Uh, this is Susan Colquette. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. You're doing well. Just as our Cultural Arts Council director said the arts bring people together, we know gardening also brings people together. And so currently we have a garden on Selman Drive adjacent to the health center and library and that garden is run by our office under the direction of a master gardener extension volunteers and they've been managing and running that garden for many years as a teaching garden and donating the produce here locally to food pantries so what we have today for you is a proposal to convert that garden to a community garden and um, you see this in the, all the parts of that proposal, the application and agreement. And today I have uh, with me Kevin Livingston, our extension agent in charge of agriculture, natural resources, and our uh, Master Gardener program. And also uh, one of our key Master Gardeners, Marjorie Stansel, who has been instrumental in helping us create this agreement and we've modeled this agreement after other community gardens that we know are functioning very well from other counties and observing gardens here in our own county also so um, we what we're proposing is to convert the garden to a community garden and have the citizens rent out the plots for each year so the agreement includes the rules and procedures it also will include some classes on gardening and advice to those gardeners from our master gardener volunteers um, and so we're very excited about this possibility we've just exploded uh, our questions around gardening from homeowners school and community gardens have really increased the past few years so we're happy to have this community garden and continue to educate our citizens. And Madam Chair, the reason this um, is on the agenda because it is Douglas County property. It was the garden behind the, uh, it was used to be used by the master garden. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that the gardeners do not want to use that garden anymore. That's they correct. do not want to be in charge of gardening it just themselves. So converting it to more of a teaching garden where the citizens can have a plot um, is the plan. Wonderful. I think that's a great idea. Board of Commissioners, any questions or concerns about this new opportunity that's coming forward? It's a new initiative. I think it's a great thing. My father was an avid gardener. I would like to probably invest myself, but I know I'm not. I don't have a green thumb. Commissioner, I have Carlton. one question. Have you all decided what the rental space cost would be for the community? Yeah, to yes, out? we have a proposed amount for this year that would be a, it's one dollar per linear foot, and the width of that garden space would be the 42 inches. <coughs> so, for example, that would be um, ten dollars for a 10 foot long space. But that's for 2019. We have a shortened year going into 2020. We propose that that would increase to $2 per linear foot. But as years go by, we may need to adjust that amount up or down. But in essence, for the rest of 2019, $10 for a 10 foot by 42 inch garden plot. That's good. Yeah. That's good. All right. Thank you so much for the presentation. So this is a sneak preview of what we have to look at tomorrow for the commissioners. All right, tab number 14, authorization to approve a funding agreement with the Atlanta Regional Commission for the update of the county's comprehensive transportation plan and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentin. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, Madam Chair and good afternoon. Commissioners. 
Uh, this is a funding agreement that would allow uh, for the flow of federal funds uh, to perform the update of the transportation plan. Uh, transportation plan typically wants to get updated every five years. It's been close to nine years since the last one was done. And initially in the capital transportation fund, uh, there was an allocation. Uh, this is a project within that fund. Uh, there was an allocation for it, uh, I believe the initial amount was 62500 would have been the local match. Since that time, um, the Atlanta Regional Commission has enacted additional criteria, additional requirements that they want to get information on, and uh, so they upped the, the, uh, the amount of federal funding that they would put on this project to half a million. So a total of 625000 for the overall uh, study. Uh, one of the things that we're going to need to do in connection with this is probably between 12 months minimum, perhaps 15 months more likely, uh, we would have uh, a, a stakeholders group that uh, I'd be approaching the board to, uh, to nominate uh, from the various districts that would be meeting uh, over uh, looking at the old uh, comprehensive plan and looking at how the county may have changed since 09 or 2010. And uh, at the end of the, <coughs> excuse me, at the end of the um, 15 months or so, we would have a plan before the board that would be adopted and forwarded to the Atlanta Regional Commission and uh, the DCA for right up. Any questions from the board, Vice Chairman Yep, Madam Chair, I want to bring clarity to this ask, Miguel. One, one of the conversations, I mean, in addition to this capital transportation update, um, there's been conversation within our, our, our transportation committee as well as sub-meetings about there's a transit component. Um, <coughs> and it's, I think, I mean, obviously, we've got a new um, uh, Connect Douglas is coming online next month. Um, there is the need to capture the data from that, as, as Commissioner Mitchell would say, the ridership along the way, making sure that's fed into this. Um, and we recognize that that could be a separate body of work. But I'm under the impression that perhaps the current scope is big enough to accommodate that consideration, making sure that that's incorporated. We're trying to avoid two contracts, two consultants, two, et cetera. Can you speak to that for a minute, please? Uh, yes, Commissioner. The, the, uh, <coughs> Generally, um, the comprehensive plan has different components within it, one of which would be transit for those communities where there are transit services. And, and of course, Douglas County does have transit services. Uh, uh, depending on the size of the uh, transit service that is provided, the, the, the size of that effort, uh, the extent of it would be how, how extensive it would be to look at the existing services, the existing needs, and then project what was needed for the future. Uh, this particular exercise initially will look at the transit component, a uh, bike pedestrian component. It will look at perhaps certain corridors, like Highway 5, that have special needs. Uh, mm -hmm. But it does not include a, a robust transit uh, analysis uh, to incorporate it into this uh, exercise would, uh, would take additional effort. It can be done together, the preference based on the agencies and, and the people that we've talked to is that perhaps uh, it might be two separate efforts. That does not mean that uh, we would ignore, as part of the comprehensive transportation plan, we would ignore the transit component. It is just done at a higher level rather than a more detailed analysis. Yeah. Madam Chair, this is that we've got a, a, a transportation meeting um, tomorrow, committee meeting. This is something that I want to make sure we, we clarify. Um, again, Douglas County is, is it, this is not a Gwinnett type of transit plan. We're, we're, we're nowhere near that. We, we ain't even got out the gate on our buses yet. But at the same point, we can't be negligent and make sure that we at least acknowledge this. They're one and the same. Um, there's no way I would want to go out to the citizens with two stakeholders 
set some meetings about talk about the same topic. They're related. All right, spending two sets of consultants, I would not want to keep them separate. I want to make sure that we're clear that we need to, if we need to expand the scope, just to make sure that it, it has enough to acknowledge all the mobility options that you just talked about without um, you know, becoming, again, doubling the price. I think we need to do that, but let us come back with a formal recommendation out of the committee tomorrow, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. to finalize what this is, because I don't, I, I, I want to, and while I've been in the same meetings with the agencies um, to understand this, I just don't want to wear the uh, citizens out, well, wait a minute, aren't you doing a transportation update plan? Why are you doing a transit plan? Like, what, 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 what are you doing? Just paying consultants, detaining them? Uh, I want to be careful that we don't, you know, and I heard the comment earlier about, okay, we're paying a lot of money for consultants. Um, if I can avoid duplication of effort and, and try to merge, it just makes sense. So I want to, can we, will you be okay if I just clarify this for the, yeah. for the Board of Commissioners tomorrow out of the committee? Yes, we do. All right, you can do that. I do. Thank okay. you. Uh, Commissioner Carthen and Director Miguel, would that uh, component also include <coughs> what the citizens of District 3 kind of talked about as far as Chapel Hill and, and what that would look like going forward? Most definitely, it, it would be corridors like that. Uh, that uh, way back, well, perhaps even prior to 2009, 2010, when the last study was done, were recognized as needing certain improvements and that haven't taken place, at least not fully, uh, in some of them at all. Uh, this would be a revisit of, okay, is the need still there, or have things changed? Is the need different, or has it gone away? So uh, most definitely, we take a look at uh, Chapel Hill as a corridor, uh, as well as Highway 5 and others, uh, to, to see where we are and whether the population uh, or <coughs> development patterns has changed and that has changed certain needs uh, for the future. Okay. But you did capture what the district uh, they made it season. abundantly obvious. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that Chapel Hill needs to be widened, yes. and that it's been over 40 years, and the growth has continued to increase. Yes. And uh, with new developments coming online, there's going to be more of an increase. So we definitely want to make sure that we really look at that corridor. Uh, thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much, Commissioner Carpet. Uh, Director Valentin, um, it sounds like it's been 10 years since this uh, comprehensive plan has been updated. Is it typically of these comprehensive plans every five years, every 10 years? Is it normal you, routine? Is that pretty routine? Or? Madam Chair, you really should <coughs> should have the update done every five years. Yeah, that was the recommendation. Okay. It's just overdue. Okay. Thank you so much. Commissioner Kyder. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pam. Um, uh, Miguel. Uh, Highway 5, at one point, years ago, was block, um, I don't know how to say it, uh, zone, block zone, that as ha the residential houses sell, that it would become commercial, it would revert to commercial. Are you familiar with any of that, and how far out Highway 5 it went? I'm not familiar with, with Highway 5 in particular. Uh, but I'm familiar with the concept of when you have a corridor change from uh, residential, residential to commercial. To, yeah, you have to you, you have to anticipate certain changes, and essentially that's what we've done with uh, with the analysis of Lee Road, anticipating that the widening will trigger certain changes. But I'm, I'm not sure. But will that. each commissioner uh, be able to appoint someone to this over? this uh, board that you're Absolutely. talking about, the citizens board, yes. uh, to represent their district and everything. Definitely. More than one person. More than one person. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we're, we're each going to have some kind of input. It's not going to be just about one or two districts. Okay. Correct. And um, would things like um, um, zoning come up? It, it, be part of this? That comes up, but at a much higher level. It doesn't get into whether you should change anything. It, essentially, it looks at the zoning map that was uh, uh, in place in 2010, let's say at the last one, and it looks at the current changes, and that sort of uh, informs potential decisions on projects, but it doesn't 
it doesn't get into the actual zoning aspect. That's but would your map, is it going to reflect what has already been done as far as any kind of block zoning? It will, it will be based it will be based on the current zoning land use plan. Okay, yes. and I'll check with Ron to see if uh, that's still in place uh, and it happened many, many years ago. Uh, but I don't know if it had a deadline or, or what, you know, if it's last. Mm -hmm. It's still there? I think there's a corridor overlay. Uh -huh. But I don't know when you say block zoning, I'm not as familiar with that. Well it's uh, it it required that if property residential property along Highway Five change um, hands, mm -hmm. it would have to go to commercial mm -hmm. rather than residential. So I, I'll get with you okay. and follow up on that. Okay, I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Carthen. Thank you. Thank you. Just um, came to my mind, Director Miguel. There are some constituents in um, my district who state that they have a lot of through traffic because people are trying to cut around Chapel Hill and go other places to try to get around traffic. Will those side streets and those areas also be a part of the study? Or would you wait to the committee to bring that to your team? We, we would. That is part of the discussion at the committee level okay. because the, the committee uh, would uh, have membership uh, that is appointed, but there will be public meetings as well where we will go out into the community to be able to <coughs> tell them where we are uh, with our effort and, and gain their input. So those are the types of things that we would hope they would convey to us during those meetings. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Carter. All right, well, we'll move on to the next item, which is tab number 15, <coughs> authorization to authorization for approval of the supplemental agreement number two with R.J. Haney and Associates for additional quantities of items required due to changes in the field conditions in connection with the ITS expansion project P1 number 0012622 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents directly to Miguel. Yes, Madam Chair. I would, I would like to uh, pull this item from, from consideration. Uh, okay. we've, we've gotten some information uh, recently, in fact, uh, we confirmed it this morning, that uh, there is some work that the Georgia Department of Transportation needs to do uh, before we are ready to do this work. And if, if they do not do their component, their portion, then I'm not sure in fact, we would not do all that is included in here. So uh, some of this may come back before you at a later date Okay. once I get a commitment from G. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. So we'll move on. With that being said, uh, clerks, would you just make sure this does not appear tomorrow on our, uh, for our meeting. And tab number 16, last but not least for the business items, is authorization to accept a grant in the amount of $10,000 for Keith Douglas Beautiful's Litter Prevention Program. Um, Director Stanley. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Chair. Um, last year, uh, we received a grant from Keep America Beautiful to hold a litter enforcement workshop. And we did hold that litter enforcement workshop in March of this year. We were fortunate to have representatives from the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, the City of Douglasville, uh, code enforcement for the county and the city. We were even able to get officers from Noonan, Cobb County, people to come and um, take benefit of the, the training that Keep America Beautiful provided. In that training, one of the things that the officers identified was the biggest issue that they, that they have with littering is people not realizing that cigarette butts are, is that that's litter. And um, so after we had that meeting, I looked for funding sources and um, I identified a grant with Keep America Beautiful for their 2019 Cigarette Litter Prevention Program. Um, they only get 50 of these awards out across the country. They range from $2,500, $5,000, and $10,000. And um, I'm happy to say that Keep Douglas County Beautiful was awarded the highest amount of $10,000. And so we will be using this fund to approve to support the enforcement of the ordinances and appropriate fines. We're going to raise public awareness with the campaign, a public engagement campaign, to let people know that this is litter too. Um, we will be also be able to use the funds to have ash receptacles and put those in transition points 
around the community so people can dispose of those. And we also will be um, distributing portable auto and uh, pocket ashtrays to adult smokers. Um, so we just ask that we um, be allowed to accept these funds. There is no match um, to help keep the this county beautiful. Okay. Any questions from the board? Commissioners? <coughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, um, Vice, I'm sorry. Is there any um, matching commission that we have to do to no, receive this? No, there's no match. Okay. All right. I am. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. All right, uh, Board of Commissioners, tab number 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, uh, regarding our approval of expenses. Please take a look at those tomorrow and be prepared to approve. Then, uh, uh, I'll have one amendment from your yes. seat from Savannah, so I'll make sure I get the clerk to that. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have our discussion items, uh, and that's tab number 22, and it's authorization to approve an amendment to the 2016 in Intergovernmental Agreement for the Fox Hall Project and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, Executive Director of our Development Authority, Mr. Chris Pumphrey, are you here? Yes. Oh, there you are. Please come forth and please present to the Board of Commissioners. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hope you all are well. Um, as, um, as you all know, we've, we've had our presentation at the last work session uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, that's when we also had the opportunity to hear from the entirety uh, of the team um, involved in the project, be able to ask questions. We also um, had the, uh, the readout or the discussion about the, um, the report from the Terminus Group uh, on, on their, their findings and the questions there. Um, from then, um, we accumulated a lot, of, a lot of questions and things that we heard from that meeting. Uh, the teams assembled, our team assembled, and, and started to work through some of the challenge that we heard. And then this past Tuesday, um, received uh, comments uh, from Jennifer Hallman as, as it relates to you know, some of the items that were you know, deemed to be negotiable, non-negotiable, um, and, and what have you. And so um, from there, had a follow-up meeting on this past uh, this past uh, Friday to kind of talk through uh, some of those things and then now here uh, today. Um, where, where we see that we are uh, right now is, you know, still a lot of, I guess, changes and improvements that need to be made uh, to the intergovernmental agreement um, and, and subsequently probably some more time in order to finalize those things and then make sure that we're able to discuss them um, with you. But what I'd like to do is just kind of go through some, some key points um, from, from where we are and based on the things that we heard this past week. Um, number one, I um, wanted to just let everyone know that the Alan Morris Company um, is, is the driving principal um, developer for, for this project. Uh, they will be, you know, they are taking the lead. They are providing the $72 million developer guarantee and that's the $72 million of funding for the Westin Hotel. Um, they are taking the lead with the Stormont Company in developing the hotel and conference center. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that, that that was clear that they are the, the lead on the project. Um, also, um, what we are looking at and some of the key things that need to be amended you know, are really related to the, the agreement related to the conference center. So we're talking about a $25 million bond issuance <coughs> that would cover um, the, the, the cost of the development of the conference center itself, which is you know, roughly around $23 million or so. Um, a $25 million bond, uh, industrial revenue bond issuance um, with, that does not have a guarantee from the board of commissioners. And that will finance the construction of the 50,000 square foot conference center. Um, the conference center and hotel will be on two different parcels, but for those of you that went to the hotel and conference center in Avalon, as you recall, it is, it is seamlessly one building. Um, there's not a, a separation of the two parcels. They are one building, and so you're in the hotel lobby, and next thing you know, you're actually physically in the conference center because you did not walk outside, you didn't walk through a door or anything like that. It's kind of one seamless uh, development. Case in point, there's the Douglasville Town Center, which is here, uh, here in Douglasville. Um, you've got the old Walmart building and you have the rest of that shopping plaza. 
the Walmart building is on a separate parcel. The rest of the development is on is in the rest of the development is a second parcel. So it is to show that you can have attached two attached properties, well one property with separate parcels on that property. And this will be somewhat this will be like that, except there won't be a wall dividing the two. So just wanted to make sure that that, that was clear. Um, the, the, just kind of the basics of the bond. So Piper Jaffrey is the investment banker who is, who is responsible for uh, going out to the bond market to raise the $25 million of bonds for the conference center. They're also taking the lead on the debt and equity portion for um, the, um, the Westin itself. So they're the, the lead group on that. Uh, they'll go to the bond market with an agreement from the county. They'll seek the $25 million. Uh, they will buy those bonds and then the, the investors will buy those bonds. Those funds will flow through the development authority and then transfer to a trustee who would in essence pay invoices for construction of the conference center. Um, another note is that the Douglas County Board of Commissioners will not be asked to write a check for $25 million. Um, it, it is the process that I just laid out. But what is being asked of the Board of Commissioners is to forego the increment taxes generated from the, um, from the hotel, that's the property taxes, um, the hotel motel taxes, forego that increment of tax, just the increment, the new tax generated from those assets being underdeveloped and in, op in operation, and to commit those taxes back through uh, the development authority and trustee to pay the debt service on the conference center. There's no recourse on the board of commissioners, the county, <coughs> to use any general funds to make these payments. They are solely based on the increment of the project. If in the point that the project does not meet its, um, uh, the, the taxes necessary to pay the debt service, that's where the developer has to ensure that those payments are made or they work on a refinance, but the county does not have any obligation to make any of those payments, just to forego the increment tax generated from the project. Um, the other change that is being requested um, in, um, in the IGA for it is the 99-year lease, which everyone has, has, has asked about. In the current form of the IGA, it is, in, it is intended that for 30 years, while the debt the debt is out there on, on the uh, conference center, that there is a, a um, qualified uh, management agreement for the use of the conference center. And then at the end of that 30 years of the debt <coughs> being um, satisfied, that the development authority has an option to sell the conference center to uh, the developer at fair market value or, or, or enter into a lease or something like that. One of the challenges in the, the, the finance you know, arena is that that doesn't give a comfort level that the conference center, the use of the conference center is committed to the use of the hotel. And by not having the use of the hotel and the conference center committed to one another, it, it, it poses risk. And so what the 99-year lease does is it, limit, it removes the risk of the use of the conference center to the hotel operator. Now with that, with the 99-year lease, there is no, as I mentioned before, the Douglas County Board of Commissioners is not writing a check for the conference center. It is just foregoing the increment tax. At the end of the 30 years, um, once the, the, the debt service is satisfied, that that property tax abatement goes away, so it is a fully taxed um, project. The hotel motel uh, tax thus comes back to the general fund um, of, of the Board of Commissioners. The, pot, the property tax, the hotel motel tax comes back to, to the Board of Commissioners. Well, what does not come back to the Board of Commissioners or the Development Authority is the responsibility for maintaining the conference center, is responsibility for improvements to the conference center, there's any responsibility of the conference center. It is solely just being leased and a part of the operation of the hotel um, and conference center business. So um, those were the, th those in essence were the main points that I just wanted to raise and just really kind of put some <coughs> clarification around what the 99 year lease actually means. It actually is a, 
it's truly more of a benefit to us than it is anything else because we have no liability or responsibility for that conference center and ultimately we are we are benefiting from the benefit of having a hotel and conference center here in our community it will be generating revenue um, for for the county um, so um, I'll stop there. There were a list of items on um, that that we received um, comments about. I don't know if you want me to go into those now or not, but that's just kind of where we are uh, right now. Okay. Um, I just have um, the vice chairman has just a comment, and then if that list that you have if it's abbreviated, you could just share some of those points with the board. Sure. I would really appreciate it. Vice chairman, obviously, you have a question? Yeah. Or do comment. Comment. Can I do the comment first? Yes. Question? Yeah. All right. All right. And I, I'll, I'll keep it tight because um, I wanted to give context to where we are in the process because um, uh, there was a comment that was made that I think is appropriate to address since it was germane to this topic. We, we, th this project is, um, you know, what, three or four years old. Um, for some of those who may just be coming into where we are with that, um, uh, the Sentinel did a pretty good job of, of highlighting, if you haven't read Saturday's paper, um, I believe it had me and Madam Guider and, and Commissioner Mitchell on the front page. And this one was a pretty pretty, pretty good article um, to give context where things are. We were sort of the three senior um, commissioners that have seen this from day one. And they quoted Commissioner Mitchell, you know, change to the change to the change, which was pretty, pretty witty uh, of that moment. And so we, we, we recognize that you've got a slow roll of this, right? So when this came before us, we made sure the original ask was for us to make a decision in one day to which the Finance Committee rejected. This is important. We made sure that the Board of Commissioners could fully have all the information they needed for a full decision. You need to have, just like when I go get my eyes, you have to have get professional opinions. Your insurance covers it, but nonetheless, somebody's paying for that. We committed to making sure we had both the financial and the legal input that was necessary to make a decision of this magnitude. We weren't playing with this. This is not an amateur moment here in Douglas County. We had to show forth that we got what we were looking at. All right. In addition, we made sure that commissioners had a chance to even respond to what they were hearing. Sometimes we can be in these presentations and it's like, oh my God, this is a long day. Like one day, like, you know, and we sometimes check out and then after that meeting we, we have these epiphanies. And as the Board of Commissioners, especially the more senior ones, they know at any given time, at any given moment, they can provide feedback. Um, they also recognize they can receive input at any time from their citizenry. Right? Uh, this has been a very transparent process. Um, you can subpoena Director Holman, who's not here, that says we have codified everything. Right? This is important. This is not no cops, side, G money deal, you know, type of sun trust. We're, we're very serious about this. Now, you, you got to clear all that out the way. Clear all the innuendos out the way. Like, no, we're looking at this as a very, is this in our best interest? Let's get the facts. Let's look at it. Let's go to our corners as very, you know, the professionals that we were hired to be, that we were supposed to make a decision on behalf of the citizens. And you've got to go through a process. Some of us may be coming to an enlightenment faster than others. That's okay. Depends on what our backgrounds are. All right? Some of us like, no, walk this out now. Make sure you understand what you're looking at. There is no rush with this. This is a partnership. Right? So we are taking our time. So at the commencement of this um, session, we've got legal. Right? We, took, we, we started with financial, took two weeks. Now we're going to take two weeks to process what legal has to say here in a minute. Right? So between financial and legal, we have all the input we need to make a decision. But let me distill this down to just really, it's two decisions. The first decision, which is what is being presented to us, is that should we make amendments to the original agreement of 2016? They're highlighted by Chris Pumphrey. The second one, which is, we, I think begets this one, is should the Board of Commissioners invest in the regional infrastructure associated with this project along with Caps Ferry? Those are two separate decisions. Investing in economic development in this county and opening up the Western Corridor is important. Without that, there's no reason to talk about the amendments. It's one, then the other. Right? You need, like, like we said earlier, well, we need, we just got septic out here. Right. 
Exactly. Let's, 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 and I know that was District 3, but it, it, it serves the whole point. <coughs> and so I, I want to make sure that as we're looking at it, we're not, let's just be honest about where we are with this, that we're being deliberate, we're being thoughtful, we're being mature, we're being professionals, and that we're going to get this right. And then at the end, we can obviously throw the political overlay on top and go in hard. But right now, we're trying to make sure we understand the facts. So that comment. So here's my one simple question regarding the 99-year lease or more importantly, the 30 years, all right? So, so follow this, because I, I, I duly noted, I get um, that Alan Morris, they're solid. I don't spend a lot of time with that. Don't have to, I know they're now number one, there's no longer uh, the, the prior applicant, but these guys have sort of taken over the deal, no problem. Um, the management company, got it, no problem. Um, the investment bankers, their reputations, okay, got it. You got a solid team, but here's, it's always about what's in it for the county, right? Um, sort of what our municipal body says, what is the value exchange? So here's the question. Let me just get right to it. So, all right, so roughly you said $25 million for these bonds, right? $25 million, to keep it simple. And because we know that the infrastructure conversation is a totally separate one. So that's the total 40, but let's separate the two. And the villas, which is the, the uh, ad valorem and the hotel motel tax, is sufficient to pay for this conference center. Is that correct? By itself. <coughs> I can't answer that. The villas were set aside, the portion of that was set aside for the infrastructure. The hotel and conference center is sufficient for the $25 million. Mm. I mean, the hotel okay. is sufficient. Sorry, right, so this, this is what's important, and this is why, uh, just again, y'all going to have to fill these gaps. So think about it. If we took the villas off the grid, because again, let's assume we might look. That was just for infrastructure. So that means that, oh, that was just for infrastructure. So that means now the hotel, which was not disclosed in the last meeting, that was key to this whole conversation. Then what's paying for this then? If the Billis was only paying for that, so where's the cash coming from that will pay <coughs> both the conference center and the hotel? Follow me. And I think you're going to answer my question, but let's just say it's going to be the hotel motel tax as well as the ad valorem for the whole for the whole thing. I got it. Mm -hmm. All right. My question is, okay, so what is that? Uh, Twenty-five million plus what? Another seventy-five million? This is where you, we still don't have the full story. If it's twenty-five million for the conference center and roughly seventy-five million, I got to keep this real simple. Seventy-five million for the hotel. You got a loan on that. It's 30 years. Keep it simple. A loan on the conference center. Yeah, just a bond. Whatever you're going to use as finance, just keep it simple. <coughs> My question becomes, and you're asking me to spread this over 30 years. This is for the citizens. Like, it's like a 30-year mortgage, 40-year mortgage, 50 years. <coughs> you guys are spreading this out over time to make it palatable. And we're saying to build this building, we're going to use what? The hotel motel tax. Uh, as well as the ad valorem tax mm -hmm. to make the debt service payments for both of these structures. Is that accurate? Recognizing it's one building. The debt service payment for the conference center. Just for the conference center. Yes. Just for the conference center. All right, so follow me. Just for the $25 million. So we're going to take everything for, and this is important, I'm sure, and I'm not, I need you to weigh in on this one. This is, you got to follow the money on this one. So, hotel, motel tax. It's just for the conference center, <clears throat> all right? So that's the debt service. So what is going to pay the debt service on the $75 million? I'll let Nathan answer that question for you. And, and, and while he's coming, th mm -hmm. this is important because we, we can't have sleight of hand. Um, you, 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 you have to, this is where I was, I was short in our last meeting when you guys made the presentation down there, but this is one of those, come on guys. To make a solid decision, you got to come clean at this level, right? And you can't say, well, I thought we were, I didn't know you need to know that. And, and so some of my comments that my colleagues, um, they know that I made or wrote had nothing to do with my <coughs> colleagues. It had more to do with the other side. Like, come on, gosh, I know I know better than this. And we need to follow the math solely. Don't make me have to go pull this out of you. Lay it out for us. I, I truly understand this whole thing. I understand the municipal bond buyers on the other side, how they'll eat this up and it will get built. But what you're not telling me is like, okay, but where's the cash? 
that, okay, you got some operating income out of this hotel that you haven't disclosed to us. Why isn't that paying for no? And let's just say, okay, all the hotel motel tax pays the debt service. I'm like, so the cash that you have made on this hotel doesn't pay anything on the note? I'm like, oh my goodness. Which is why some of my comments are like, oh no, I'm about to claw this back. So, it, it, and we shouldn't have to do that. I just need you to lay out for me. And again, Nathan, you know where I'm going. This is, this is a setup. He knows I'm going to, he knows what I'm asking. Please walk the full board of commissioners through the, the whole that I just referenced, which is you got to get a count for the hotel motel tax, that at the local, your debt service, and operating income. A E I O U sometimes Y. There are some fundamentals here that are not been addressed. Stay there. I know there's 26 variables you can talk about now, but whatever. Focus on those five things first. I will. Uh, thank you, sir. Vice Chairman Robinson, thank you very much. It's a, it's a very fair question and uh, truly understand where you're coming from. Uh, I, I think we do owe the Board of Commissioners and the administration uh, a sources and uses summary for the hotel because these things are not straightforward. Uh, financing large development projects is never for any large development project. Um, the, the project, in, if I were to put it in the simplest numbers, is roughly the hotel and conference center, <coughs> just the hotel and conference center, uh, not including any of the infrastructure or the villas, is uh, just over a hundred million dollar project. That meaning the total cost to build, to develop, to, to provide equipment, services, furnishing, Everything that goes into opening a hotel right down to the coffee cup that sits in your hotel room when you go in there and you want to make a cup of coffee. Um, that's about just over $100 <coughs> million. Uh, $25 million of that is uh, for the conference center. Um, that will actually net about uh, 22 and a half to $23 million in usable funds. The balance of that $25 million issuance is in reserves and debt service reserves. So there's a portion of that $100 million plus that sits in reserves for both the public financing, the $23 million, 50,000 square foot conference center. The balance of that 100 plus million, let's call it uh, uh, roughly $85 million, is for construction of 255 hotel rooms and the other kind of relative amenities, the spa, the, the restaurants, the bars, the coffee shop, everything that goes along with a world-class hotel and conference center. So within that $85 million, we have about $15 million in equity. Uh, that is actual hard funds uh, that come from the Allen Morris Company and our partners. Um, and then the balance, about $60 million, uh, sorry, $70 million is, um, is a private loan for the construction uh, that typically comes either from a bank or from a fund, a private fund, investment funds, uh, and that's a loan. So we're paying interest on that, so built in, again, the cost is support for that. That loan, that $75 million loan, requires a guarantee. Uh, it requires someone to come up and say, we guarantee that if ever there's a default on this loan, we will provide a backstop. And that guarantee is from uh, Alan Morris. W. Alan Morris and the Alan Morris Company provides a, a, a personal guarantee. It's actually a guarantee structure through a series of assets that we have set aside to guarantee such loans. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, all right, then I, I, I appreciate that. Just to give and, context, so. And, and, and we will provide that, a document for y'all this week for to the commissioners to, to show exactly what all the sources and uses are for the project. No, I appreciate it. I mean, guarantees are important. <laughs> we're, we're a public entity, all right, so you can see what our credit rating is and, and, and so forth. Um, I'm sensitive to private sector partners um, 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 showing their financial balance sheet. Um, just like the prior operator or owner of the Merrill Group, he did not want to provide his information publicly so that other citizens could not see it. I got that, but I, I made sure that, no, you're going to show us. Um, I mean, we, we went offline, I allowed our finance department to sort of witness what that is. I need the same courtesy, just it, it needs to be validated. You know how the rules of engagement are regarding financing. 
um, we, we need to make sure that, that that exists. Second to that, um, which, is, which is important, which is the readiness of the county to be ready to like, ready to go. My question is, we know we can go to market pretty fast on anything through our development authority or through our sales, 120 days start to finish. But what's key here, which, which, which drives this whole thing, is the performance of the hotel. To the citizens, this thing will be built as stated. They're going to make sure. So we're going to have this beautiful facility. <coughs> I'm less concerned about the structure. I'm more concerned about how this thing is going to perform. Right? And, and can it cash flow in a way that has no exposure? So then my question is back to your, I mean, so you got a loan against an $85 million bill. It doesn't matter. Just keep math. You got a loan. <coughs> you got this debt. Is there sufficient operating income to pay that debt, no different than somebody's got a job and you have an, a, enough um, income coming in to pay their loan? This is very simple. We need to see that. Right? We, we need to see that, and I think you said that impact analysis, that economic analysis, it exists. We need to see that. You can't get ahead of a decision until I see that. I just don't know. Will it get be built? See, sell me on whether or not we can use junk bonds and so forth. You know, as they say, high yield municipal bonds. That's easy, guys. Think will get built. I right, spent a lot of time on that. It'll work the way they designed it. But what you got to push through is okay. But y'all ain't answered my question, which is it's all about the hotel. It's not about the spa. It's not about the conference center. It's like why y'all keep focusing over there? The issue is the hotel. <clears throat> That's what drives it. Price of the room times quantity, occupancy rate, gives me some revenue. Can you make your payment? So here's the second thing, and I'm, 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 I've got it, I'm helping my topic. Second thing is, your, your, um, do you have the loan lined up? Your, your, your comment was, well, it's like a, and we're, we're trying to be very specific. Do you have a lender, like you have UBS and Piper Jaffries, they're on board to issue bonds for whether it was infrastructure, or for the conference center. My question is, who is the lender that is going to loan you $85 million for this? Now, I get the development authority can do what they do because we're government. It's going to get done. But when you have a private sector partner, and again, I'm, I'm not pushing this if there needs to be something, but some kind of way you've got to disclose to us who's lending you this money and show me some type of letter of intent. There's plenty of real estate people in here. This is nothing new. It's the same fundamentals. Show me a letter of intent that we can get comfortable that says that, okay, are y'all really ready to go? We, we don't want to get too far ahead. If y'all really are not ready to go and y'all trying to see, well, we know what we can do. The question is, are you ready if we were to approve the, these amendments and give that, are you ready to go? And we need to have assurances. So me getting ahead is like, well, guys, ain't no, ain't no to, to the citizens, there's no rush. The county is, is prepared to do whatever it can do based on just like we do, whether it's a spas or whatever. We do what we do. But in, in a partnership, this is important. So can you answer the question on is there truly a lender at the table that, that um, has committed to you, and it, I don't care, it's the spirit of it. You don't have to be letter. And the spirit of it is going to give you $85 million for that hotel. And the second thing is that in your sources and uses, does it disclose to me the operating income and how much is going to be applied to the debt to pay off that loan and how much, because this is important, I want to know if I'm paying for the hotel and the conference center through <coughs> Hotel Motel Tucks and Avalon, I mean, you mean, I'm saying, oh, what, y'all going to sit on all the operating income and you have no debt payment? That's an issue. That is my only issue. I have one issue, that right there. You have to solve that for me right there. That's the fundamental math equation. All these hotel motel taxes, <laughs> all the Avalon, and I know we were given some concessions, let that go, are going to go straight through this thing. The bondholders get all the excess. I get it. They get the hotel motel taxes. They paid $1,000 per block. They add up. Guys, I get that. My question is, where is the operating income that this hotel is making if I'm paying for it as the county? I'm paying for the conference center, which is a joint building. They gotta be together. I'm paying, and, and that's what I'm like, gosh, y'all are not showing me the revenue cash, and that's the part. That right there, where is that operating? And think about it, guys. 
you don't have to pay it then because the county has paid for the whole thing. That means you get to keep all the cash to yourself. I need some accounting for that on the other side. That's what I'm saying. I keep trying to get around. I'm eventually get there. I'm not that blind. I'm going to get around that corner. And I'm like, okay, guys, answer this question. So that's my fundamental issue to my peers. I, I just have that. The rest of it, I'm immaterial. I can yield to whatever angle you guys want to work on. Uh, I don't believe in guaranteeing um, the, the, the infrastructure. I think there's no way, first you're going to take all my cash and then you want me to guarantee, like, no, uh -uh, that's too much. I'm a solid no on that. Solid no on guaranteeing infrastructure uh, for the project. That's too much. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm making this like, we're not trapped in the corner, yet, guys. We're not at the 80 yard line back there, you know, this way. We're not two, two yards from a safety. It's like, no. I took a proactive approach to this project, like, okay, wait a minute, let's clear the air. We're not. No, no, I, I, yeah, I get it. I see it. No, I actually see them. But I need, I need to get this out. And this was important that you got to get this out there because there's a lot of questions. I, I finally got some emails from a couple of people, and we're not being clean. And, and, my, and yet this is my point. If you guys are pitching, we should, these should be answered up front. And, and my point is, and so there's a lot of speculation. I'm like, no, clear the air. Please help us clean this up so we can get to a point of clean decision. That's all. So I'm setting your context to get you to where you want to get to, but you've got to answer it. Okay, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Go ahead. So, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, as I understood your question, uh, it, it's, it's uh, do we have a lender lined up? And, and the answer is no. Um, the, the process for funding these projects, and we've closed in the last 12 months about $300 million in construction loans in Florida and Georgia. Uh, I just myself closed a $101 million construction loan with Bearings, which is the lending arm of Mass Mutual, uh, about, about a month and a half ago. So this is something that the Allen Morris Company has done very regularly in our 60-year history. Um, but there are things that we need to be effective in selling bonds and securing private loans. Uh, and, and when you're talking about mm -hmm. a hotel conference center uh, in the U.S. typically, meaning in most cases that we're aware of, uh, the, the public, some level of commitment on the public portion of the financing is a prerequisite for offering the bonds. In other words, bond buyers, <coughs> the people who are actually purchasing the bonds, want to know that whichever public entity is joining hands with the developer in the hotel conference center is actually committed. <coughs> so if we were to go out and attempt to sell the bonds before we had that commitment, we, we would we would not have a successful bond offering. It wouldn't go anywhere. We wouldn't sell the bonds, and we will have all not used our time effectively. On the private side, uh, the construction loan for the hotel, uh, which I would love Chairman Robin, Vice Chairman Robinson to be in a situation where I had no debt on a building and I could take all the income uh, directly. That's not the situation on the Westin Hotel and Conference Center. There's very significant debt service on the $75 million private loan, and that's where the majority of the hotel operating income goes to support that and the 250 employees that will be employed at the <coughs> hotel and conference center, um, who are very, that's quite a large payroll, as you can imagine. Um, but to answer your question, um, we have to have that commitment on the public side of the funding, some level of commitment. We view that as a revised intergovernmental agreement that we hope to negotiate with the board. Uh, and we also need to be able to make other representations to the private debt markets. There are many representations we need to make. Our guarantee, we need to show them what substantiates that guarantee first and foremost. We need to represent that we have a significant team. We need to represent that the hotel, when it's built, can be operated. So things like, <coughs> is there electricity running up the hotel? Is there water? Is there sewer? Are there roads? Uh, and that was the context for uh, the infrastructure bonds that were previously discussed. So until I have all of those representations, both the infrastructure 
and the support on the public side for the conference center. I can't market it. What I can provide to you are letters of representation from many lenders we've worked with, uh, TD Bank, SunTrust, Bearings, any number of lenders who will provide letters to the Board of Commissioners stating that as long as the Hotel and Conference Center meets their underwriting standards, they will loan money to the Allen Morris Company. Okay. All right. I, and I think I can summarize this. So back to your point, it's the chicken and the egg. Uh, but, but we would not, I could not support the issuance of any bonds for the conference center until I had assurances that you got your loan for the hotel, right? Not, not one thing moves, right? Because again, we, you, you can't, that's important. We need, we need to see that you got your money together. See, we're not concerned about us, but I got it. We got to do our part, guys. We gave you this, these, these, these agreements. We gave you these concessions on that intergovernmental agreement. When do you show us your hand and have it proved? I got it. Infrastructure, I get it. But the current structure that you had, which was the challenge of guaranteeing it, that's the path of easy resistance. It's easy for you to sell something if you put a county's credit on the line. But this makes your investment banker just have to work a little bit harder. He says, well, well, why are you in my credit card? Why, why can't I just use my checking account and do it this way? And so what I was trying to show my peers, like, guys, we were, we were in, a, in a passive position. We sort of like, let's, let's get it. If we want to get involved in this, we're not the tail. And I, I think in a partnership, it's just like, well, are we really there yet? And this is the, the issue that I have with this current process, but maybe it's a good thing that we're doing this publicly, is that a lot of this should be worked out. But you, you got the Board of Commissioners actually working on this. Like, I didn't go, get to go to the Sheriff's thing this weekend. I didn't get to go to Roger Bruce thing. I know I'm going to hear it less that. I didn't get to go to, to see the Trailblazers and see my friend get awards and so forth, because I stayed at home. And I immersed myself for 48 hours in this information. But this is probably the only <clears throat> subject that I get in this totality. So my, what you're hearing out of me is like, okay guys, okay, I get it. But I'm trying to take the pressure off my team. Like guys, we've been still, we're good. We're like, they, we're not there yet. So to the citizens, like we're not there yet. We still need to hear about the hotel. Give me it, don't, don't tell me in a PowerPoint presentation, show me. So we can analyze and update our financial document with the hotel component to it. We've got the legal coming. We're not there to make a decision, which I thank um, Madam Chair and the County Administrator for pulling this from a distance. We weren't ready, Madam Chair. There's no way that you could adequately, because we don't have all the information yet. And so I'm, I'm trying to surmise where we are. It says, guys, y'all got some holes to do. Um, you you got to give us some full information um, for us to get there. So, that being said, I, I have nothing else to say. I mean, I pretty much have framed, like, we need more information to make a decision. We, I guess we'll come back in two weeks and see where we are. Um, my commissioners can go in as hard as they want on any angle, but until they give us the fundamentals, let's talk about it. I, I, that, I mean, mm -hmm. not, not in a public forum. It's like, okay, well, just do the homework. Just do the work. Just, just give us the information so we can make a decision. But I, I think that there's, we, we need some more input. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Any other comments before? Okay. Board of Commissioners and also, you know, tab number 22 and 23. I'm just going to consider those combined because it sounds like we need some, some deliverables or uh, pending. Yes. So with that being said, uh, we'll perhaps I guess you can make arrangements to come back another time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Get, I mean, again, we'll pick this up in our finances. You know, again, I guess the ask is that the economic impact uh, uh, when we get that, we will submit that to um, the goal is submitted to our municipal body to update his risk assessment. Uh, <coughs> okay. I'll do it out of community if you don't mind. We can do it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for Thank the presentation. You. Next, we have uh, tab number 24, uh, which is Fox Hall with legal Thank findings. Uh, Madam Chair, Chair I, I didn't, the, the agenda item reads that way, but essentially what we have is this. We're going to be presenting an executive session because this deals with our opinions about legal matters. Uh, a full, re full report to this board. I would say for public of public consumption because I think both the chair and the vice chair have asked me to let the public know what we have done. I can say that we took the terminus material. We have talked to uh, David 
Corbin at great lengths multiple times. Roger Murray and myself, Roger sitting behind me. Roger's a partner at Murray Barnes and a finisher. We have not talked with the people involved with the development itself. We're not weighing on the merits of the development. We simply took the structures that were evaluated by David Corbin and we did a legal analysis in our opinion about those things. And so I will be reporting that to the board and the executive session. <coughs> what the board chooses to do, whether it be up to the board. So I plan on doing that today. Okay. Thank you so much. Very good. Uh, that's all, at this time, you know, next we have board appointments, but that's also to be discussed in the executive session. Uh, Attorney Bernard, at this time, do you need to go into executive session? You need one for both. You need executive session for legal, real estate, <coughs> and personnel. All three, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you so much. Board commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? Ten minutes. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. So <coughs> Assuming <coughs> Commissioner Mitchell is right there. Yeah. Okay, so we have a majority, so the motion carries. Uh, take 10 minutes, get your yes. get your yes. and come back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, board commissioners, we are back. And thank you so much. Are there any other items that need to be discussed? Vice Chairman Robinson. Madam, Madam Chair, just as, as a point of clarification, may I? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the previous question that we were talking about regarding the Fox Hall proposal, uh, I'd like to um, make a recommendation that we take this back up at our very next uh, work session uh, for an ultimate vote on that Tuesday uh, on whether to A or 1. Um, the Board of Commissioners will approve um, the um, economic development uh, investment in infrastructure and two, approving the intergovernmental agreement amendments for Fox Hall. Two separate decisions. Take them up at our very next meeting, up or down. Okay. So next meeting is the next two weeks? Two weeks. Two weeks. Which June, June 3rd and 4th? Uh-huh. Yes. June 3rd and 4th, but I guess we don't want to be misleading to the citizens. Mm -hmm. You said to approve. We'll just yeah. say to approve or disapprove. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's, just, let's just make sure that for the record, I don't want them to say, well, yeah, to I consider. see what you said, to consider. To consider. Yeah, yeah, consider. Yeah. yeah, we'll say consider. You will, you will say what you want to say in your motion, guys. I'm just, yeah, just we got to you. get it. Yeah, I'm just And hey, Madam Chair, those items 23, uh, let me get the right number, 20. 22, 23, and 24 were, were technically discussion items, so they, I think they can probably just be removed by the chair if the chair wants to. Okay. Uh, if you're going to do it by motion, you have to do it at the meeting. But I think because they're not business items, yeah, if you yeah, want to take them off, you can just yeah. take them yeah. off. Yeah. I said none of these are agenda yeah. items, so all of them fall under that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is just the work yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so, yeah. uh, and, and 24. Yeah. Infrastructure, yeah. the local yeah. fundings, and. Yeah, 24 won't be on there. None of those. Yeah, none of those. This was the last year. Okay. So, top of confirming county clerk? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I mean, I'm sorry. Yes, June 3rd or um, 4th, we're we going will to place it on the work session of June 3rd. Okay. And the and commission meeting. Yeah, the commission meeting. to consider again. Yeah. yeah. To consider, one to vote. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I just want to confirm for the open record how all this going. Okay. Well, if we don't have anything else to come before this meeting, this meeting is adjourned.